Hi, Bob Dub. Hey. We're going to have a conversation. Yeah, how fantastic. How fantastic. So you have a You know, I told you I've been dreaming about our neighborhood becoming tight knit yeah. and it's it's happening. It's it's not just you and me, it's on minds. I've already talked to a couple of people this morning that are saying we know what the battle is. This is the hill to die on and I'm like, Oh my Jesus Lord <laughs> Yes, it's incredible, isn't it? Those young uh, people, they are. How old are they? Are they up to 40? Uh, or you think they're younger than 40? They're around 40, and the youngest one is only 26. Yeah. Yeah. There's some very uh, young, so yeah, very young, young men. And, very young. Uh -huh. mm. And I talked to Justin again this morning, and I told him what we've been talking about, how yeah. they're going to be the warriors. They're going to be the leaders. And he said, I told you before, he was talking about, I'm going to be fighting with God. And he says, if I die, I want God to bring me back and get me back in the battle. And I'm going, oh, here we go. <laughs> they're ready. And this guy across the street, he's well, maybe a little older than Justin, but he's still not older than mid-40s. He's got a little bitty toddler. And I'm, we're talking to this guy, and he was listening last night to me listening to Amazing Grace, I started singing along with it. I was singing quietly, but the way our porch is, it's like a, a band stand. It's acoustic. Yeah. And they heard it. They stopped talking and they were listening. It was like outside church last night. Wow. Wow. And I'd never wow. seen his wife do this before. All this is flooding back in my head today because he came over. It's mm, like, mm, mm. you know. His wife came out and brought a tiki torch out because they were standing out there and they were complaining about the bugs. And she brought a tiki torch out so they could stay out there. And they were originally just talking about the neighborhood and, and they saw me up there. And I know he was thinking about me because we'd already talked before and all that. And then this morning, I had literally just gotten dressed too. This is so funny. Mm -hmm. I wasn't, wouldn't have been ready a second before and I sat here getting dressed and then I looked over this is my window I can look right out on his house and he's walking up the sidewalk I mean talk about just on time I just got presentable wow and he, if you don't believe in God you should ask him to show you because my he will tell you without a doubt yeah. And I, yeah. when I said that I had um, heard God tell me to talk to him, that was almost a, when you have that gut feeling and you're thinking in your head and it's your own voice, kind of like your, your common sense, it was like that, you should talk to him. Yeah. You know, that was so clear. Yeah. Most yeah. of the time, it's more of a nudge or a, a feeling. This was like an I told them about the spring. You know, I told you we have a spring here. Yes, yes. And we happened to mention in the backyard that we're going to, this is going to be our hill to die on. This is our home. We're going to enjoy it while we can. But if things go south, we're in a place to stick with, and we need to protect our spring. Yes. They were thinking the same thing because his house backs up on that street. And he's like, Oh, yeah, I'm planning to stick it out, and I've got things prepared, and we know about that spring. And yep, so we're already building. We've got our neighbor over here. Yeah. yeah. We've got them. We've got the neighbor on the other side. I mean, we're building a core already. And the sad thing is that three of us are probably going to drop off of this because I'm old. The neighbor down the street is in her 80s. My neighbor across is old. But we're speaking to these young ones. Mm. Him, his family, he's got a boy, a teenager. God is preparing everybody. Yes. Anytime yes. I put something up on mines, I put a lot of stuff newsy up on today. Mm. And these guys are coming out of the woodwork. I spent 10 years with my, my buddies in Afghanistan we aren't going to put 
they're getting they're like mm, i'm up to here yeah they're they're being made ready and i put these things up it's like it's not a conscious decision a lot of people probably their channels are more automated mine aren't i get up and i'm like okay what do i post today and I remembered last night I had a couple of things up there and I put my always things up there that I always do. But I decided for some reason to go to Gateway Pundit. I usually go to Daily Mail because it has worldwide. And I started reading the titles and I'm, oh, I had to put them, something said, put that one up, put that one up. And I got hit with just people coming back going, Another guy was, I, I mentioned the Battle of Athens, Georgia. I don't know if you know about that. Yeah. It's, yeah. and this is going to be happening. And these people are answering me right back. And they're going, even that wasn't right because nobody got charged with a crime. Oh, no. These guys are way ahead of us. They're just waiting for somebody to come out and say it. Yes. I was thinking that in the mo in this morning when I was just eating coffee. I was thinking the thing about revolutions, what they say about revolutions, is that they don't happen until people know what they want to change into. Mm. The spirit building up and this thing, and once the community figures out how they want to change, then suddenly everybody changes together. And I was thinking upstairs, it's sort of been stagnant for the last maybe five or ten years. People have been mm -hmm. saying, we're going to change, we're going to change. And then um, with the whole Donald Trump thing and how the whole of America just rose up and voted for somebody completely outside of everything that's ever happened before, just showed mm -hmm. me that this is the spirit of the people. And, um, yeah, and then I suddenly also had this feeling also like, maybe common sense maybe a message from god saying it actually is all there we don't have to think out another revolution all we have to do is go forward with god's will and it's all happening there we don't have to figure it out we don't need to know what society would look like we don't all we need to do now is get with the program trust god's plans Trust what's already happening, that's happening everywhere around us, mm -hmm. and go with the flow. I think that's something you were saying when you were talking about the dancing moths. Yes, the circuit has to be open. Yes. We have to be flowing in it. You can't just stop it by saying, I don't know, I don't know if I can do it or not. You know? Yeah. That negative. I know there's times when you're mourning negativities, but this isn't the time as far as that goes. This is the time to be, we're being prepared. I, I think about how I read about the revolution, American revolution, yes. and how it could have never happened if miracles, I have a book about the miracles, 13 miracles that saved the United States. Wow. And things happen that I sh I'm gonna have to go get that book again. It was amazing. And those things happen in Israel when the Six Day War, there was a, a battle where they were so confused on the other side. They were thinking that they were being overrun and they literally ran away. There was no battle. They literally ran out of fear from something that wasn't even there. Uh, yeah. I think I remember. And, and machine guns didn't work that, you know, on the other side. Just crazy things like that. Mm -hmm. When God is in the middle of something, we don't have to worry that you know we're all so trying to control it we're trying to do it our way that's not going to work we got to just open that circuit and he'll tell us he's like this that's happening right here i was thinking oh how hard it's going to be this neighborhood what a, it's kind of a shambles because after um, when obama came in it was a neighborhood that was being rebuilt okay. and all of a sudden the bottom dropped out so all the buildings stopped, the neighborhood started deteriorating, people moved out, hmm. crime picked up. Well, none of us like that, yeah. but the ones that are here and have invested in it, now we're seeing, oh my, 
this guy's going to buy up derelict properties and try to fix them up. He, he doesn't care what he's saying right now is what I'm being. I got to make my neighborhood better. Oh my gee, who knows how long it'll get till those guys are out there? We may be long gone before this, or it could be tomorrow. Well, but if you're listening and you're paying attention, he's just laying it right out in front of us. I know you're having to do a lot more thinking about how we're going to approach this, what we're doing right now. You're you're kind of the mind behind it, and I'm this um, no, spontaneous one. Powerhouse. But right, but it does take that. Even though we've got this this kaboom going here, there's still got to be people underneath that are the support system. All right. So I've got the vision. You've got the organization mm, you know and, I so. <laughs> and well it's got to be somebody's got to it's not just gonna unless we put it up raw which yeah. <laughs> the way we are, that's probably not the best idea i'm sure we can do that down the road yeah. and we probably could now but it's just somebody has to be the structure Please. and i think we're performing that in a way what we're going to be doing we're building a structure we're I told Justin, he said, we need a new church that the church that everybody's going to now, it's dead. It's literally, if it's not dead, it's dying. Yes. It's been spoiled by corruption, by the American Christianity that all oh, is money and success. And these guys know it's fake and they hate it. And they didn't read the Bible like my generation did because they were so disgusted with what they saw. And what Christianity has become. They believe in God. He believes in Jesus. But he's like, I don't want to go to that church you went to. That is not where I'm at. And I said, what do you think it would take? And he says, a whole new thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I said, well, what do you think of what we're doing? He says, you're on the right track. <laughs> oh, that's so nice. They're begging for it. They're begging for it. Yeah, there's online churches like... Um, this Bethel church but there's so much they're embroiled in all kinds of is this biblical is this not and they're big and they're already under suspicion I want us to be like you were saying last night we're grandmothers we are godly women and we're not going to be acting like these fools that call themselves pastors out there we're just grandmas and we're telling these guys there's a church right here, but we'll help you figure it out. And then I honestly, we're going to bow out someday and they're going to build it. That's right. Yes. We're like the, um, yeah, the grandmas, as you said. I was just thinking um, as you were talking about your community. And I was thinking about God works all things to, for good for those who love Roman the Lord. 28. You know that one. Mm -hmm. Isn't it amazing how all over the news and all over everywhere for the last sort of year and a half or so, there's been this drive towards social distancing and masks and cutting yourself off. And mm -hmm. isn't it strange how that has galvanized people to draw together? You know human nature, people want to do the thing that they're told not to do. Mm -hmm. My friend here who owns the orchard and who's uh, Aspie, he does not leave, he doesn't like people. He doesn't go to town unless he has to. He doesn't leave mm -hmm. the orchard. He's got his uh, work that he works on his computer and he's got his workshop where he does stuff and he's got his uh, orchard where he's got to mow and do the fruit. And so he's got all this stuff and he's set his life up that he doesn't have to go out and meet people, right? Mm -hmm. So he said to me two days ago, he said, oh, this lockdown's really getting to me. <laughs> and I said, you've been an Aspie. lockdown? You've been locked down for the last 40 years, dude. <laughs> mm -hmm. And he said, well, they're just telling me I can't go out. Now I want to go somewhere. <laughs> and I was thinking to myself, yes, it's strange. Another thing that people say don't do. Don't be online. Get offline. Get offline. Get out into the community. Do this and that. And yes, we have to. 
but mm-hmm. isn't there this 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 sort of a almost drive to make you think that if you're online you're doing something wrong mm-hmm. so, Even my son. yeah yeah <laughs> well there has to be a balance of course with 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 god there's always the balanced yeah. way to be but it's mm-hmm. amazing as if everything that we think that evil is doing to the world it's as if the Holy Spirit is just transforming that into, you know, well, we're actually going this way, God's army. Why don't you make mm-hmm. a community? And mm-hmm. then you go outside and you do what you say. Wow, you know, okay, how are we going to do this? And, and people have been doing it for a while, you know. People have been, yeah. well, not people, but the mainstream people have been mocking preppers and conspiracy theorists and putting down people who are feeling the change, you know? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, you're so stupid. Of course, it's not happening, wada, wada, wada. And then get off the internet. But where is the organizing happening? On the internet. On the internet. And because we're... The tool tool that we should use till they burn it down. And trust me, it's going to eventually. They're going to... They're going to limit us because they know that we're using this. I don't know how they'll limit it, but they'll find a way. If it's that social credit score or whatever, yeah, they'll find a way. While we got time, use what you got. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yes. Yep. Well, I was so thinking about... What's that? I was thinking today that we should perhaps start off with recapping where we were last week. The reason I'm thinking that is that um, Chris Duguid, who's just been such a wonderful support to us, that Chris mm-hmm. said to me, way to leave a, Chris, a cliffhanger. What happened in 10 years' time with your phone calls? <laughs> <laughs> I know. I saw his comment. It said something about left me wanting more, like when's more or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> what are you <laughs> That was really interesting because, yes, I think that that's where we were talking. We were talking last week when we were, were finishing off. We were talking about the, the social credit and mm-hmm. being observed, watched, surveilled. And what mm-hmm. my point was in that 10 years comment that I made was that everything that's done on your phones and your all the stuff that's happened, everything is surveilled. Mm-hmm. And there are these few little platforms like Minds.com where everything that you do is end-to-end encrypted. Mm-hmm. And what is the benefit of that? People say, I'm not doing anything wrong. I don't care if they watch me. And that's a valid right. point of view. My dad says that and my dad never does anything wrong. He was born before the Second World War and he's very, very honorable and he only ever does what he thinks is the correct thing and he obeys the law and he's just not perfect, but he's one of the guys. He isn't worried about anybody. If he had a camera in his house, he'd be happy. He's. However, there's the other side of the story. There's the mm-hmm. side of the story that says Christians are being persecuted now more than they were in the circus time of um, Nero, whatever those guys were, those those where the, the Christians were all fed to the animals and the sick. Yeah. There are more people, there are more Christians now and children, a lot of children, being beheaded, thrown around, mm-hmm. having okay. limbs okay. cut off, being thrown off buildings, being thrown off a building because you're gay. I mean, being stoned to death because you're a woman who was raped by your next door neighbor. So you get, what sort of evil is there going on in the world? Of course we need encryption. Mm -hmm. Of course we need privacy. And what you were saying earlier about the boys, um, like um, antique arms, Mm -hmm. so ready, ready, prepared. The preppers, the conspiracy theorists, God's army, encryption, Mm -hmm. social distancing. It's as if you can't make this stuff up. Yeah, we don't even have to put it on the internet. My son said we need to get some emergency food. We we got extra 
you know, we're buying supplies that even nobody told us to. We didn't have any extra money even at first, and we were still doing it. And then when we got more, we're like, sock some more away. I didn't have to art. He said to me to do it. Yes. And he's got a friend. He's not as old as me, but he's he's kind of in between. Oh, my gosh. We didn't know, but he's a huge prepper. If anything goes down, he's a person we can depend on. He's just a few blocks away from us. Right. Everything is there. It's just yeah. like we don't really even need the If the Internet did go, God would still find his way. Right. Because we're being told things. The best internet, honestly, is prayer. But this is the next best thing. And it was put here, even if it was meant for their good and our evil, like you said, you'll, you'll turn it around and use it. And it is being used. Sure, we're going to be sure. doing a lot more than just starting. And we're starting all kinds of new ideas here. Yes. Healing people, getting them ready setting it up for them to take over. And I remember when I left my church, I don't even count the one I went to for a few weeks because they were a weird cult. Mm -hmm. But the last real church I went to was a, a Pentecostal church. My neighbor took me to, got me involved in. And I thought the guy was a chicken when it came down to speaking out and, and being brave for God and saying there's some laws higher than man's and he didn't do it. And I was, when I left, I told you it was such a momentous feeling like that was the, that was it for that. And I had been talking with his wife about starting a new thing, something that I told you about. We were feeling like there was something I was supposed to be doing, but I didn't know what. And ever since then, this walk is just like, here you go. Honestly, I think I delayed it by my fear because censorship sucks for my discomforts with him. I love the guy anyway. I we don't are we don't think the same. We we have different thoughts and different goals. But God put him in my life to pull me out of my because he talked to me a long time ago. Let's have a discussion. Come come and talk to me. And I, I just shut my channel down and walked away. It's like oh no, nobody's going to talk to me. <laughs> I just shut it down. And I just keep thinking, how much of a head start would I have had if I'd been listening? I just, mmm. <laughs> so, yeah. talking about keeping circuits open. But <clears throat> I'm just sort of saying that what you were saying about the dark nights, they, they're like, they're coming out of the woodwork. Coming out of another one I had not even thought about for a while. He's up in Michigan. I won't use his name because I haven't talked to him yet. Right. But he's a younger guy. He's online. He plays video games. But he's like Justin. He is just like, come on already. And I told him about the Battle of Athens. And he was the one that wrote me back. He says, yeah, well, they did all their part. But whatever happened, whoever got arrested. And I was thinking, oh, man, these guys are way ahead of me. They're already knowing what happened before, and they're going to not do it the same way this time. They're going yes. to—they're the ones that are going to clean house. I think so. And they're ready. They're ready, so we don't have to worry. But I do think our our job is our talks are going to encourage them to come out of the woodwork. Mm -hmm. And like you were saying, yes, this is end-to-end -end encrypted. And yeah, they could break that encryption if they wanted to, but they're going to go to the places that are easy to break. They're going to go to Facebook. They're going to go to Twitter. We do have some extra layer of safety. And I've seen so many people, oh, poo, 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 the NSA, they could break that in a minute. Well, yeah, they could, but they got Facebook. They can all go mine all they want. For some reason... Mines has stayed relatively small, and I used to wonder about that. Like Justin always said, it's like a honey pot. He's, he says, Mom, I don't think this is a good thing. And I said, I, I think you're partially right. She told a lot you from wrong. the start. Google, I'm talking on my own, but um, now I lost track. Sorry. But it stayed small for a reason. We are a core. I told John the other day, I said, This place. 
there's something special about this place. These people that have gathered here, they're like nothing I've ever seen anywhere else. Now, I've had some bad experiences with people calling me names, but overwhelmingly, I, like I had one bad experience this week and I had to think about this person. They're a Marine. They were basically telling me, stop crying, shape up. Yeah. Is what he was yeah. basically telling me. And I took it really hard at the time because women are so emotional. But Justin, I have to tell you before I stop, something he just told me he said today. Get acquainted with solitude. Analyze your situations before you get emotional. Analyze it separate from your emotion and things will be all right. Wow. And what was I doing the other day? I let that hit me like a rock and I went and whined like a baby. And I got up the next morning and I was thinking, yeah, your drill sergeant just gave you a slap and said, hey, get back in the game. <laughs> you know? And here I'm like, woo, 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 woo. <laughs> It's easy, hey. And, I and he's that still, the guy, he's a wounded warrior is. and he has his problems, but Yes. He is a dark knight. He doesn't know it yet, but he is. Yes, it's really great. I think another thing that I'm finding, not finding, another thing that I'm maybe coming to terms with is this thing of, uh, Mark said to us that a little while ago, he was talking about something about Eve. And then afterwards, you and I continued the conversation and we talked about Adam. And that's mm -hmm. the thing, isn't it? The guys are talking about Eves and the girls are talking about the Adams and saying, where are his Adams? The, the point that I want to make is that this is being led by men. This massive movement is as if there are men standing up and taking responsibility and being the yeah. leaders and they're not even telling anybody to do anything mm -hmm. yet. All they're doing is standing up and finding their own strength. Yes, and they're standing up and saying, hey, I'm here. Absolutely. That I'm seeing. And they have built these internet communities. Mm -hmm. They have built what you were talking about, John. And this, yeah. I mean, these men have stood up and built platforms, websites. I think of Josh Who TV. I think of the mm -hmm. Dark Horse podcast. I think all of these extraordinary things that all sort of blossomed out of that QAnon movement where everybody mm -hmm. was being driven to look for the truth and inspired with these questions and this, have you thought of this? Have you put on the armor of God? Are you trusting the plan? Are you taking everybody with you? It was just this sort of massive explosion of conservative platforms yep. which have become communities. And the other ones that are like us are getting much more attacks than they are. Parlor, Gab, yes. look at the battles they have. And Mines is over here quietly plugging along. John is a believer. I don't know about his son because I don't really know him well and I haven't had much contact with him, but I know John believes. And I've heard people not John and mm. oh, he's in it for the money and he's mm. selling you for info. I don't, I'm telling you what I'm feeling in my heart. That man believes and he's encouraged by things when I say, John, these people here. These people are precious. And the more I tell him that, the more he responds to me. I didn't even, out of the blue the other day when I was in tears and falling apart, he just, peace be with you. Wow. You want to start. I can almost cry over that. This, we know the people that made this platform and we talk to them. Micah, I am nobody. Literally. Yes. But he takes time to talk. And it's not just me. He talks to so many people. I wonder how many hours a day he's spending talking to people online. Mm -hmm. I, he is building this place. It is a community. Mm -hmm. We may be all over the world. And we're losing people, yeah. 
but we're getting new ones. Mm -hmm. And I think this place was put here for a reason. It's, it is a kind of a honey pot, but you know, like you said, again, it can be turned around because God always uses things the way he wants. And here this little honeypot has become a little treasure trove. Yes. And we are going to take advantage of it. Because yeah. I told John one day, I said, one thing I hold dear is my right to the First Amendment that I can have my religion, my faith. It's not a religion. It's my faith. It's right. my life. I deserve to have the free speech to put it here without an NSFW marker. And he agreed with me. And he's turned a lot of channels that had that and put it and taken it off. It was only on some platforms. It was really weird how it was on some and not on others. Probably Google did those things. Yes, well, but he it understood didn't take me. A lot. It didn't take a lot. It took one nasty person to report something. And then there was the doubt there. And mm -hmm. you know, when you've got doubt, you can go and look for something and find some evidence. If you're looking for it, you will find it. Yeah. yeah. I was thinking. But now I make it clear to him this is our platform. And I think he understands that this is important to me. And now we've got a thing going here. And I don't think we're going to have to worry about things like Parlor getting taken down or Gab being taken over by a person that's a He's taking that thing on his own little personal agenda over there. And as much as I know they want to have a little more control, I know they feel that pressure. Mm -hmm. They're bowing and saying, yeah, this is, there are limits to free speech. You got to, it's, we're going to just have to live with some of this because he's having to live with it. Mm -hmm. We can't blame him for something that he's stuck with too. You can't say certain names or forget, you know, like we said, we have to function within this limitations, but thank God it's here. Thank and where are we drawing all these people from? I'm not hearing anything over on Facebook. No. I have a channel over there, but that thing is dead as a doornail. Mm -hmm. well, the one I'm on YouTube, but I haven't got like 100 views. We got 800 right here on mine. Yeah. Yeah. Over 800. It's amazing. Hey, this is our this is our mouthpiece, and we it's being put here to use. Our church is here, and we're gonna. This is where we're our hill to die on. We're yeah. I'm planting my flag. That's right. Uh, you know about the uh, John and the development team and everything that they're doing, and what I was saying about just just two seconds ago about fathers and men standing up and taking. Uh -huh taking the responsibility that God's given them to be the leaders of their families and their communities. Mm -hmm. I've been thinking about fathers a lot, and I was thinking about the amount of uh, resistance, the amount of resistance yeah. that the minds team have had. Mm -hmm. and I was thinking, imagine that you had a child mm -hmm. who every time the dad tried to do something for the child, the child said, the child said I don't even want that. That's the wrong color. I wanted a green bike. I don't want that red bike. Take it away. So the dad takes it away and he gives him the color that he wants. And the kid says, oh, well, that's fine. But why isn't it a motorbike? I want it actually a motorbike. So the dad goes off and gets the motorbike. So then the kid says, oh, well, that's all very well. But why aren't you going to take me? That's kind of what's happening to the development team. No, mm -hmm. please. Thanks, dad. Wow, thanks for making us a nice playground here. Wow, thanks for trying to deal with this issue with tokens and giving people like trying to undercut other people. And, and okay, I know, yeah. mine drives me crazy sometimes too. And it is yeah. experimental and it's brand new and it's on the blockchain. It's what Facebook isn't, Parler mm -hmm. isn't, Gab isn't. This is a new experiment. Uh -huh. And yes. the first thing that I've noticed, okay, after noticing the glitches, because I also want everything to be perfect, and why shouldn't I have what I want? <laughs> <laughs> I want perfect free speech, not compromising <laughs> on my principles. And I do. And, I do and that's what I did three months ago. I was throwing a fit. Yeah. And it's but now I'm more grateful. That. Yes, it is hard to become grateful, even out there in the real world. You know, mm -hmm. oh, man, I was going to get outside, but look, it's raining. Come on, God, I don't want. <laughs> really? But that's what we do. That's what humans do. 
Amen. And John is literally the father of the other person that's responsible for this place. And I really don't know Bill, and I probably never will. He's so much younger than me. At least just John is my cup of tea. John is where I'm at, you know. And I started thinking about what you were saying the other day, too. My God, this guy hears all these complaints, and I bring in complaints. Yeah. But I say, hey, John. Could you look into this? I really appreciate it. And if I think it's really important, I'll even go so far to say, I love mines. I, I just want mines to be better. Yes. But then when he does, the, I thank you, thank you, thank you. I am, I always follow it up with a thank you. Yes. And he'll put a little, little smiley face or yes. something. But I am grateful. I've changed my whole attitude from before I was going to battle to make this place right. Yeah, I'm, I don't own this thing. Mm -hmm. We all are part of it. That's right. And what I think might be right, yeah, well, my, it is part of things I say are true, but like if you do yell fire in a crowded theater, you're going to make some problems no matter how you look at it, even if it is a real fire, right? Yeah. yeah. And I started thinking, what's valuable about mines? Do I really, what's important to me? I still have my friends. I, No matter what they change, yeah. My it cores are, I, told, I don't even go to the news feed. I know who my people are. I've got a tribe. <laughs> Those nice? people. Yeah. yeah. Belonging. Belonging. And you know, not just belonging to mines, which is lovely, but belonging mm -hmm. to all this wonderful bunch of Christian people on mines. That come out of the woodwork, too. Yeah. yeah. Now, I do get hit a lot for my Christian posts, and I don't post as many anymore, only because some guy talked to me. I don't think I ever got his permission yet, but he told me we need to be more universal, and I lashed back at that a little bit because it's hard for me to be universal. I know my faith, There's, there's. I have my rules that Jesus is the only way, but I do know enough to know that he could have other names. He's God. And this guy m reminded me that if you try to be more inclusive, just try a little bit. And I was being so stubborn about, I'm um, holding up my cross. And then I started thinking, well, these young guys are getting turned off by that. Mm -hmm. Because my son, my own son, I'm a Sunday school teacher, been Sunday school teacher all my life until just last year. And he went to the same church and is like, this church sucks. It's fake. So yeah. my faith turned him away. Mm -hmm. So who am I to say I know everything here? Mm -hmm. So I'm taking my Christianity and putting it out on my sleeve, but I'm not going to, I'm going to try not to be so offensive about it. I am who I am yeah. and I'm going to put up what I want to put up, but I'm not going to throw it in your face. I'm going to say, this is what I found. Instead of trying to, I grew up in a Baptist church. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there are, Oh, you've got to go out and win souls. You've got to save your neighbor. You've got to keep them from help. And I always rebelled against that. I always thought it should be personal. If you want your neighbor to come to Jesus, go over and have a coffee with them and talk to them and show them what you found. So I started thinking that's what we have to get back to. We have to walk away from all this fake I don't care what people say. Those churches, even the best intended of them, they're freaking fake. You walk in, somebody, and I know there's exceptions to this. You, you walk in with your best face. You go, some of them have coffee, and you go sit in an auditorium as like this planned performance. Or even if you're in a small church, you go in and you get in this Christian mindset. Hey, brother, so-and-so. And you talk a certain way and you act a certain way. And, you know, certain things you shouldn't say because, you know, people aren't heck with all that stuff. Let's get real. Those churches, they're going to die with all the old people in them. I'm sorry. They're dead and gone. And these ones that are all these crowd appeal things, they're not teaching. They're not teaching Jesus. Yeah. They're, they're entertainment. Uh, That's what took. And it's neither. The, what, what happened in China, all those underground churches, we're building that right now. Whatever's coming down the road, it might not be like China's problem, but the United States is in for, we already are in trouble. Yes. And these young guys here, they're saying, oh my God, I wish I had a place I could go. 
but I'm not going where you went. I want something that makes sense to me. And Chris Duguid, another one, he's pulling away from all that religiosity because he sees it's fake and I want to pull them back to who Jesus is don't get yourself too far because then you get stuck in this new age and these dangers where you're going to fall into a pit and you're going to walk right past Jesus because he's quiet when Justin said that be quiet yeah so this internet church this <laughs> I even hate to call it church. How about a Sunday conversation? Because they're even turned off by our terms. It's well, we'll because we, we'll 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 we drag we'll them into the mud, though, you know? I want to bring these guys in, with, like we were saying. My son, I think he's interested. He used to say, I'm never going back on the internet. They took his channel on YouTube, and he's just like, I'm good. He's, he's listening. And I said, you want to come on? I said, yeah, maybe. He usually just no, because he's Asperger's. If he never had to talk to anybody again and stay in his basement and burn for the rest of his life, he'd be happy. But he has that need. And he and Chris have a thing. He and Chris are good friends. They don't really talk to Justin not online. But if he was, he and Chris could go, whoa. He and Chris hit it off so well. Cool. And that's what we have got to just focus ourselves. We are the grandmothers, so we can't make what they're going to have down the road, but we can say, we're going to talk real talk to you guys. I'm not going to be up there on a platform telling you're going to hell and all these Christianity things. I'm going to talk to you face to face. You're going to need Jesus because things are getting tough. Whoever you want to call him, he's the, he's God. He's the son. He came here and lived this for us, and he knows what we went through. If you can identify with him, forget all that stuff. Just find who he is and get quiet. He'll talk to you. If you're out in war and, and a bomb blows up your Bible, then what are you going to do if all you depend on is a Bible? Yeah. you got to be here in him. And I think that's what these guys are saying. That's a book for 2,000 years, and it's been great for you guys. And, yeah, we'll read it for comfort, but we, we're trying to find the source of it. And that's what I think. Yeah, the Bible verses are great. And I will keep including them because when times are hard, when I get really, really down, I still go back to that Bible. And he knows where it is. We've got a Bible right on the family, family Bible out in the living room. And it was his dad's. He knows where it is. And he knows and he will look up things when he needs to. But for him, he's like, what do I need this, this thing when well, I know him? Yes. And I thought, Oh my God, <laughs> it's just, they're just direct, they're already in the current, like we were saying, they're already flowing. They're already flowing, yep. Well, I think that what would be really wonderful, I'm springing this on you with no warning, I was just wondering if you could maybe pray for us as we start. Give us sure, a word of forgiveness or, you know. Yeah. How you do? Okay. Leave the past and dedicate ourselves towards the future. All right. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and I'm not going to close my eyes because that's okay. kind of dumb when you're talking to someone else, and I'll be talking to him too. But he knows. Yeah. 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 Father, we're here with you today, and we're not perfect. We know we make mistakes, but we know you know we're human because you were here, you lived it with us. And you don't expect us to be perfect, but you do want us to listen. And you want us to pay attention to you. So I ask you right now to forgive me all the times that you talked to me and I didn't answer right away because you've been trying to get to me and it was my failure not to hear you. And that is my shortcoming. And the second thing that I ask forgiveness for is to watch over this tongue. It's in the Bible. The tongue is life or death. And sometimes I may not say the things that I should. So I'm asking that you take control of my tongue. That whatever should be said, I'll say. What shouldn't be said, we won't. And I ask that this time we have, that it will go further than me and Bob Dub. That our friends, our sons, our dark nights, 
they know they are with the, I talked to one yesterday, God, and you know who he is. He said, that's the perfect word. So God, watch over those dark nights because they're out there and they're, I think, a little afraid in some ways because they know that what is here is ending and it's going to have to all be made new and it's kind of thrown on their shoulders and we're not part of that, God. We're the encouragers. So when they have these fears, let us answer them if you want or have someone else, a man that they need, be there for them because we know they're our future. Our future, we're the washed up old grandmas. We're just giving you hope because our world is going. We're going to go with that old world just like Moses had to be buried on Mount Pisgah because it wasn't his world. He, We're not going to. We might see it. But it's not going to be our world. It's their world, God. And I just pray that we are the tools that you use to make it happen. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear. The hour I first believed. We decided to pitch our, remember me talking about pitching tents? Yes. We're pitching our tent. We're staying through. This is it. This is our home. This I'm not going anywhere. Yeah. A lot of people are talking about bugging out and going. We're in a blue state where we have a Democrat governor. And most of Illinois is Republican. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. Chicago controls everything because it's such a big city. And the rest of Illinois, there's a couple of good-sized towns like Bloomington, Peoria. Mm -hmm. you know, there's some mm -hmm. good-sized towns. But the control is coming from Chicago. So all of us conservative people are... are under this thumb of these, mm -hmm. and we're like, I'm not going to leave my blue state because it's better picking somewhere in a red state. I'm going to stay here and plant my flag. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that that's what it is when you're shining a light to other people. Mm -hmm. You need to take that stand. I was thinking about, um, uh, I was thinking about what you was talking about the other day. Was it yesterday? When you said somebody called you a Debbie Downer. Yeah. And last night mm -hmm. I opened my little book, that book that I told you um, by Lucy Horne, The Resilient Grieving. And I opened it. Oh, you've got it. Wow. Yeah, I got Victor Frank up to you. I still haven't gotten Rush, uh, Salman Rushdie's book yet, but I'm, I'm going to order it. I keep forgetting to order it. Okay. Yeah, I have it okay. Right okay, so I opened that last night after we had that really amazing talk together, like having church together. And it mm -hmm. was so interesting. This was the page that it opened at, right? And it was ways that the bereaved can help others to support them through grief. Okay, so grief has kind of been the thing that brought us together. And then mm -hmm. last night I opened this little grief book and boom, here's the story, this little thing about how we can help. Don't expect people to be mind readers. You know they can't possibly understand what you are feeling. Imagine that your family and friends are mind readers is known in psychology as a thinking trap. 
and is recognized a significant barrier to resilience. And then it just goes on to say about how you should talk the truth. You shouldn't try and always be strong for other people. Tell the truth. Try to be as open with your feelings as possible, even if they are hard to articulate. Even if they change every minute, tell those closest to you. Explain to them that when you say you're fine, you're not but that it's hard for you to know how to encapsulate the torrid emotional journey that grieving is in a one-line answer to the question, how are you doing? In the book that she wrote in response to her daughter's death, Sandy Fox suggested that we say, I'm doing the best that I can. That seems hmm. to be a reasonable goal and a succinct reply that doesn't claim that we're sailing through. Isn't that sweet? Yes, very. I know when you look at it from his point of view, the person that made me feel that way, he had his reason for saying what he did. Oh. And we're not really that close. But if the person responding had been one of my other closer that I, I kind of lost touch with him because he's up at night and I'm not anymore. Oh. We used to be a lot of the time we catch each other online and we have conversations but it's kind of faded those things that you bounce off each other and then and he's still a, a good friend and he will be a dark night if he's if he's called on he'll be there but he he was seeing it from his point of view and i'm not going to let that bother me because like you just said i'm being honest about it and like i told them and you i have my tribe here i have people that when i go on and i say Ugh, I'm having a bad day. I get response back. I'm praying for you. Come over to chat. I want to talk. Or do you need me to read to you? Those are my tribe. And I really don't care if you want to come and complain on my channel that I'm being a Debbie Downer. Because the people that need to hear it, they're there and they're responding kindly. You would not believe how many very warm compliments. And you're grieving. Uh, Peggy, too. She's like, you guys are okay it's gonna happen don't feel bad and other people too you know it's just all the the need that i had was met so when the other ones come that are extraneous i saw you had somebody make a nasty com comment on one of your posts and you're like well i could report you you know the people that need to hear it heard it and they responded and i got what i I guess I was attention seeking in a way. Yeah, I'm hurting. Hey, guys, can you cheer me up? Absolutely. What's wrong with that? I think you know? that's where I'm with. Uh, that's where I'm with you at, on that page. Is that mm -hmm. it, I'm feeling really bad. Somebody came to the door yesterday. They, one of the other orchardists, they spray was spraying some poison on there. Well, not poison, but stuff, and mm -hmm. just wanted to warn neighbors. And so we stood two distance, two meters. We did the social distance thing, and it was bizarre, you know. Anyway, that's not the story. The story is he asked me, "How are you?" And he hasn't spoken to me for a year, just because neighbors. And it was mm -hmm. really hard to answer that, and it yeah. was really hard for him to listen to me answering it. The what I got to say was some days are better than others. Mm -hmm. And he was really uncomfortable with me sort of mentioning, I don't know how to explain this. Guys don't handle our emotions as well. No. no. And it's important. They want us to say, I'm fine. And if we don't say, mm -hmm. I'm fine, then they want to tell us, be fine, be fine. You know, and it's quite a hard path to walk being a woman. We mm -hmm. want to be supportive and we want to look out for them. But there is a lot of woman's emotion going on. The thing that absolutely finished me are the pictures of the naked women screaming in the streets. And I understand they had their issues. They had their way of dealing with it, but that's not my way. And mm -hmm. it made me severely uncomfortable. And I'm thinking, yeah. this is what a lot of men are saying. 
where walking away, we actually cannot deal with you. Mm-hmm. And we, you and I have both had these broken relationships and we understand yeah. how awful it is when a man walks away from you. Mm. And so these men and these women yeah. are going, they're both going their separate ways. And I think that we coming together as women and talking as women and trying to be supportive of the men and understand what they're doing, mm-hmm. it's quite a difficult thing to get hold of our grief and our emotions and all these things going forward. So yeah, I just thought that that was quite, a, quite an interesting and little, because little, I've also, my family says to me, come on now, be positive, you're not going to get through this unless you're positive, and, and I'm like, okay, oh, be really positive, but I'm not positive. I'm not, not and I get huge guilt, huge guilt. So it's a very mm. complex, it's a very complex thing, this being in a church. Yes, you know? yes. It's even hard for me. I think I told you once before, nobody's grieving this like I am because they weren't as close to either. My son actually resented his father's behavior. But I was remembering all the good years that he can't even remember, our years that he was a baby and a child. And those years were precious to me, but it doesn't mean a thing to him. And with my mom, we've been so, she had her own life and I had my own life that we weren't touching base so much. So they aren't as close to her. They don't have the years of time with her. So they're not in major, you know, the real heavy grief like I am. And I'll go out and I'll be in tears on the porch and I start to wipe them like, oh, God, I don't want the guys to see me. You know, we have to look at this. Guys don't grieve the same way. They don't have their emotions on their sleeve. Even if their emotions are on their sleeve, they have a lot more control of them than we do. Like Justin just told me today, get a hold of yourself, pull your emotion out of it and analyze it. You know, I don't. We do have to do that to some degree, but they're the one. He's telling me what he has to do. That's right. We have to be us. We have to be women. We can't act like men. And I, I wanted to say that to him. I might eventually talk to him later, this person we know who he is. Like, hey, you know what? <laughs> this is your way, but women, we have our way. Yes. And I was calling out to my group of people that, that, and they were right there. You can see the proof on the page. All those positive remarks, yes. you know. Yes. And, and we cool when you're the yeah. so, Yes. Yeah. We have to let each other be who we are. The men, I know they don't like our emotion. And that, that's something, I you know why I think that is. Because we've been having temper tantrums for how many freaking years. Yeah. When they see real genuine emotion, they're turned off by it because that's all we've been doing. We've been dumping our emotions all over these guys. And they're stuck with no kids, no wife, pants, child support to see their kids twice a month. Mm. And here we are. I can see their side. I can. Mm. But I do hope they're seeing our side, too. Yeah. Women are women are women are women and we emotion is what runs us. Yes, we can control those, but for us that's what makes us tick. Yes. What makes them tick is being able to overcome them and organize themselves and just keep on keeping on. So if I say anything to these young guys and even our our older dark nights, it's like a situation of being accepting of each other, you know. I'm hoping that we have men on here, but this is our show. Like you were saying the other day, we're going to do it our way. And I know there's guys that are willing to come on here. I've, we've talked to a couple of them, and I think they understand that this is our show. But we want to give them, we want to share this, you know. We we all have to do it in our own way. But if anything's going to improve we've got to stop this polarizing you know like you were saying when you're down say it there are some men on there one of them one of our dark nights and i haven't cleared with him to say his name so i'm not but he knows he's the doc you know the guy that Mm -hmm. one of our dark nights and he does talk about his feelings and stuff Mm -hmm. but you know where he does it Mm -hmm. go over into chat let's not have that here 
the ones that do talk, they they have their their time and their way of doing it. Mm -hmm. So I think some of them are on that page. They understand, yeah, we've got to let these things out, but there's there's their rules and there's our rules. And for us ladies, we're gonna cry, we're gonna be sad. And I'm not gonna lie, guys. I you can call me a Debbie Downer all day, but I'm I'm just being honest. I am picking myself up out of that bed every morning. I mean, there's mornings that I lay there and I'm like, do I want to get up? It just hits me so hard. My mom's not here anymore. That hit me the other day. I sat up and that was the first thing that came to my head. I'm I I just don't want to go on. But you do, you know. You get up and go on. But those guys, they're not feeling that. So this is my grief, and I hope everybody understands us. I, I know when you first started talking to me, you said, I hope you don't think I'm insane or something. I am insane because I'm so freaking sad. You know, you just, everything falls apart for us women. But they manage, I'm, I don't know how they do it, honestly. They manage to pull it together and hold together. And I think they almost resent us, like I said, because we've been screaming and moaning and wailing. Well, I think that's what's but, so great about us getting together. They've already done their getting together. They're, it's time for us to stop screaming in the streets. When I was getting divorced, that's the thing. I, I was married to this man who was drinking every single penny that we had. And oh, anyway, let's not talk about that. I went to the social work welfare people, I went to the social worker from the mm -hmm. mental health people and I said, I do not know what to do. I've already been divorced once, I've already taken my children away from their father once. Now I've got these other children with another father, he's drinking, I've been here 10 years, I don't want to give this up one up, blah blah blah. And she said to me, well, it's the whole package. If you take the man, you take his drinking. Hmm. I said, but my children, they're not good. And she said, uh, your children will be fine. Children of divorce are much better, if, a bit better off if they aren't with parents that are fighting. You should split up. You should take your children away. You, you, this man is drinking. He's blah, blah. This was my actual advice from the actual professionals. I went to them to say, please help me. And they said, the help we'll give you is teach you how to live on your own. And so, I'm not excusing myself, but I'm just saying that we were given this advice on how to cope with our relationships with men. And I, and I know a lot of people that I know, actually... Oh, That's my direction. <laughs> That's my Okay, a lot of people that you know. Sorry. I know. I'm I'm sorry for this Doesn't distraction. Meal time. Distractions are fine. Meal time is important. <laughs> it's just yeah. that the advice that I got on relationships from the highest person that I could go to, not my friends, not my doctor, but the guy that was the counselor that was there, and she was a mm -hmm. good guy. But I know that me and my friends were given the advice and it's really a good idea to get divorced. And yeah. we went from Not us thinking we were doing the right thing to now the guys that they, I mean, our daughters basically. We've shown mm -hmm. our daughters to walk away from men. And now yep. the men said, well, we're walking away from you too. And then everybody's saying, yes, but what's happening to our culture? Look how mm -hmm. our culture is falling through the cracks and what is the problem? We don't have any children. Nobody's having children anymore. Feminism mm -hmm. has become lesbianism. And men have just decided that they... Anyway, sorry, I've said that about 17 times now. But, yeah, I, I do think that it's our time. And mm -hmm. I do understand that there are a lot of men out there and that they are guiding us teaching us the new technology, helping us to do this stuff with emotions and everything. And that's wonderful. But it's very strange for a lot yes. of women who for the last 40 years have been told the best thing to do if a man doesn't toe the line is to divorce him. Take your children away. It's better for your children to take. That was a mistake. 
That was a mistake. Yep. I have a sister who has two test tube babies. She had one guy who left her at the altar and another guy who left her for another woman. And she decided that she wanted children desperately, even though she couldn't have a man. And so she uh, went ahead and had her two children and works at a very, very high-powered job. And her kids go off at sort of 8 in the morning, and then she's foot home at 5, 5 36. And that's, that's her life. Those are her two little boys that she's bringing up. And, I mean, I, I, I think she's wonderful. I'm not oh negative God. about her. But I'm just saying that is what it's feminism right. has done to families. Yep. And feminism started off really awesome. awesome, and it gave us a lot of power and agency and education and all sorts of wonderful things that women weren't getting before that. Yeah. But they are not, but, but we somehow what do we lose? have crossed a line, and those words of Justin, what, pull yourself together and get your emotions under control. <laughs> <laughs> Analyze without emotion. Analyze without, be objective, step back. And basically, they're, they're sort of saying, grow up, girls. Grow up, mom. Yes. And we're saying, And they've already up. had their grow up thing. They have Jordan Peterson slapping, come on, puppies, it's time to be dogs now, you know. And they they've had their sponsor. Where's ours? Yes. <laughs> Well, we're out here languishing. Like you said, we were told, leave these men. And in my instance, the one I should have left, he was very violent. There's no answer to that. You can't fix people that aren't willing to be fixed. Yeah. And if they're that violent, I didn't have any children. That one was wise to walk from that. Yeah. And he's just, his whole life is just trouble. It was the best thing I could have done. Mm. Now, my second husband... Yes, he hit me once, but he was so depressed and he was in such a terrible shape. Honestly, I blame it on the Navy because they just dumped them off. Oh, yeah, they give them a couple of classes on post-Navy life. Yeah. But when you've been in this, your whole life and your whole world's falling apart, your whole family needs support. We could barely pay the bills. We had people, the landlord coming to the door. At one time, the landlord came to the door with a gun. Because we were late on our payments and, you know, he knew Mark was a military guy and he was like, you're going to pay. You know, that kind of pressure is going to pull a family apart. And what did we have? Nobody saying, you know, go to this counselor, get some help here. It was like, yeah, you guys need to get divorced. Yeah, you know? that's exactly it. And if you go to the counselor, the counseling you get is on how to live without the other person. Yep. Not how to make an inroad to get back, to, to get your relationship, to get yourself healed. No. no, no. All they've done is push us. This polarizing, I saw somebody use that word today. We're already divided. Blue, red, men, women. We're being pushed oh. apart. It's almost like this was a plan to just get us. And what did it do? It ruined the family. And the family, that's the structure mm. under what our whole society is built on. Mm. And I don't want to, a lot of people say, well, it's because we're not in church anymore. It's because we've lost faith. Yeah, the Bible was pulled out of church. People quit praying. But there was a reason for all that. We were being led down the wrong path. And when we did try to go back to where the help could be in church, what did you hear? I know what I heard. Well, you. this is what I heard from one. It was my first husband. He was so violent that I was in a shelter for battered women and the police were, were going around the block because he was so bad. He knew some policemen and they knew it that some of the police were on his side. So they were protecting this place because I was in it. I had to divorce that guy. Mm -hmm. There was no way around it. But when it came to that next one, that precious love of my life, where was the support? Yeah. It wasn't there. We were told, fly the coop. Yes. Leave them. And then they're stuck with not being able to see. One of the things that tore my ex up was not being able to see his children. I told him he could see him, but the court said, okay. you don't.
it's like you said, everything is all just going according to plan. I don't know what's going to happen with me and this walker, but now I've got a wheelchair. I can scoot around. Once I figure out how to use it, everything is all just... Remember how frustrated I was waiting for that darn wheelchair? Oh, I and now that awful. It's sitting out there because I can't get my room rearranged because I just I can't get myself motivated. <laughs> but it's here. It's here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Baby steps. Baby steps. They work. Yep. 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 So it seems like everybody's having that. They, you know, whatever preparation he wants for you. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't say he, God. We've decided we're not going to use those pronouns. <laughs> but uh, It's interesting, isn't it? And isn't it interesting yeah. how, how fixed language is? Like you were talking earlier about the Bible and how people want to uh, look to other sources for their information. And, and that's fine. I'm, I, you know, I think that's great if some... For me, still, I'm back. Sorry? I said, I've read those other sources, but what do you always go back to? What do we go back to? The thing we learn from our children. That's our yeah. thing that it's in your brain from when you're a kid. And it's your thing, you know? And it's, mm -hmm. I find, it's really hard for me to just not speak for the whole world. I feel, everybody's doing this because I'm doing it. But um, I find that I need to just be able to allow myself to ground myself in the Bible. I know that mm -hmm. a lot of people are like, oh, you're banging on about bloody Jesus again. <laughs> That's what I've got. That's what I've got. That's what I need. And I'm going to just, yesterday I was thinking I'm sticking with this. I'm sticking yep. with what I know. Maybe I'll be taken somewhere further down the line. But to start off, I really need to start off where where I am. Yeah. Basically that's all that's all it is, isn't it? It's just accepting that you what I am what I am. Yeah. And I I hope Chris is listening. I, Chris, I want to tell you this right now. Chris is not too keen on the Bible because obviously the same thing that I have with Justin. But don't let yourself get so turned off that she lose that valuable book. Because when things get tough, I've been in a motel room. I don't know about you, but I've been like, we just left the husband who was beating on me in a motel room all by myself, beaten up, crying in tears. And what was in the drawer? A Gideon's Bible. Every time. And you can open it to the first page when you're depressed. When you're feeling like committing, I mean, there's things in there. Yeah, you guys, you have your new world and your new way that you want to worship, but don't throw the Bible in the trash. Please don't. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. There's a lot of the Bible. Yes, the, Michael Heiser is one that's really helped me come a long, long way, and it's sad. He's got cancer now. He might die. He has pancreatic cancer. But he took the Bible, and he made it so real to me. He talked about it in everyday language, like I do when I teach Sunday school. I don't go in there in my class with 10 or 11-year-olds and preach at them. I talk to their level, and I play games with them so they understand. And that's what he did with me. He he explained things. I'm educated, and he uses some big words sometimes, but he reached me and said, hey, this was written for these people at this time, and it was valuable for them, but it's valuable for us, too. It's a record of what happened. Yes, the most new of it is 2,000 years old, but the Bible has more proof that it is valid. There are so many copies and pieces of it. And they found the Dead Sea Scrolls and found that the Old Testament's like line for line, word for word, jot for, they have these little jots and tittles. It's how they separate their words. They're word for word, line for line, jot for jot, tittle for tittle. That Bible was put here by God for us. And I know these younger people haven't had a good exposure to it. They've been hit over the head with it, basically. Yeah. Yeah. At least in my family, it was go to church and do it. When he got older, we gave him the option not to go. But when he was little, we made him go. Mm -hmm. And he could see the fakeness in it. Mm -hmm. And it makes me sad that he could see the not good part mm -hmm. and is not seeing the good part. And I blame myself for that some because... 
I taught it in church, but I trusted that his Sunday school teacher would teach him. And I wish, I, I know my husband and I did it for a while. We did little, um, where we'd get together and we'd read a little Bible story and we'd, we'd have our little time. I wish we had kept that because all he can remember is the schooling. And we did do it some, not enough. And I just want to tell these young guys the day's going to come when you're going to want to, you know, in the World War, they had these Bibles in their chest and their pocket. There's going to be a time you want to grab for something, and I need to read it right now. Are you here with me? I know they hear him better than we do. But those solid words, I got to read you the one that, you know, we were talking about doing a Bible verse. Yes. Yes. This is the one I had today. It was my daily verse. It's Psalm 91, 1 through 2. Now tell me if this doesn't mean it for us. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. So I want to have Chris on here, and I just, I'm telling him now, be prepared. I'm going to battle for that Bible. It's one the, a hill I'm going to die on because I know when the time comes, I know my son turns to it. He's actually come upstairs and said, you know, I needed, I wanted to find something. So I went and read it and he comes up and talks to me about it. I know there's going to be times. And if they don't even hear it, if, if Chris never picks up a Bible, if he watches these videos, He's going to hear verses that I think he needs to hear. The, the one last night that's turned into a song, the Lord is my shepherd. He goes before me. He goes behind me. Oh, my gosh. How encouraging. Is, and some of it is in this song now. You don't even have to read the Bible. There's scripture songs out there. So I'm telling you guys, Please, that is the voice of God, and it's been held precious for, please, please, please. There was a, even a movie made about that, that one about the guy that carried the Bible around, and he had it memorized line for line, verse for verse. The book of Eli. It's going it's to be important someday, guys. It really is. And if you don't ever pick that book up, me, you and I, we're going to give them a few. You know, like Romans 8, 28. That's one I'll never forget. Justin's grandma and grandpa were pastors. They were both very, she was a, an organist. He was the pastor. They decided to get married on August the 28th because that was such a precious verse to them. All things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. We've been called all of us are being called, all you dark nights, all you other dark beauties out there. You've been called. And if he doesn't reach you through that Bible, he will talk to you directly. But please, if you ever get, to, I just tell my son, I told him the other day, if you ever get depressed, open it up to the Psalms. Open it up. It will, man, I can't count how many times it's comforted me. And maybe they'll write their own books. I don't know. People say that the Testament's written and closed. Why? Yes, it's written and closed for when Jesus was here. But I think we're coming into a new time. You said eventually Jesus is going to return. There's going to be a day he's going to be back. And I want them to know who he is and what he said. You know, I know he talks to me directly. He talks to you. We, we all have that. But it's important to me. It's like these people taking these monuments down, these statues. They're taking our history and throwing it away. I don't understand that. I, maybe it's not important to them, but there's a day going to be coming that they're going to have to find out what is important. What statues are you going to put up? How are you going to feel if your kids throw that statue that you love down? Yeah. So that's yeah. the one thing I will not compromise on. Yes, we can make it universal as much as we want. But like you said, our faith is ground. It's grounded by that. It's, it's, oh man, I can't put words to it, how extremely important it is. 
I think that, so I, I, think hope that, that I think that I agree I think that strongly on that. Yeah. I think that, I think that those, a lot of those stories and a, and a huge amount of the stuff about food and animals and what is clean and what isn't clean, that was passed down from word of mouth through hundreds and hundreds of years. We've still mm -hmm. got the Bible. It's still being printed. It's still the best-selling book in ever. Yeah. You know, it's still there. So there are things in that book that are extremely important. And yes, mm -hmm. there's a whole lot of stuff that doesn't apply right now because we're in a different world. But if we were to ever have this thing where the, all the electricity goes out and we are actually living in a post-apocalyptic world, those laws from the Bible will suddenly become suddenly relevant. Well, you oh, had that yes. village over there, remember when they caught all those seafood and then they all got really ill and died? But it's in the Bible, isn't it? So maybe yes. we should actually look to the Bible and find out. So I'm not saying, in, in my idea, I'm not saying that the Bible is the only source. What I'm no. saying is the Bible is a source that has lasted for thousands of years. Because there is something in there that is so fundamentally beneath the words. Before you hear the words, it's truth. There is a type of truth. And you cannot get it from somebody else. It's a truth that you have to come to in your own heart. And a lot mm -hmm. of people find the words of the Bible that come from other people who have struggled who've been the Debbie Downers of their time. I mean, is it Jeremiah? Uh, who is the guy that's... Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. I'm reading in Jeremiah right now. <laughs> Gosh, let me tell you something that you just said just a second ago that I just, it just like knocked me. I had never known about Romans 8.28. Hmm. I don't put verse numbers onto verses. So right. I, I never know. Awesome. Yeah, I never know where to find the verse because I just. Anyway, Carly is going to. She would have been twenty six on the twenty eighth of August. That was her birthday. Oh my God! All things work together for good. My little baby. There's something that I don't know. That's bigger than me. And she was sent to me on the day. To help you remember that. And I didn't even know the whole time she was alive. I didn't know. And it's her birthday on the 28th of August. And then it's the anniversary of her death on the 22nd of September. So I'm working up to this really hard time in my life where I've got to deal with her premature birth and all the things. And my ex-husband coming into the hospital when I was there on the drips and they were start trying to start labor. And he'd kidnapped the other kids from the school and brought them into the labor ward where I was sitting. And the woman in the bed next to me was there nine months pregnant and her baby had died a week ago. And she was sitting in the bed with her baby, her dead baby inside of herself, waiting for to have a cesarean section. And this woman in the bed next to her had this husband yelling. He pulled the drip out of my arm. My kids were crying. And there was my baby in, in Kali. So her birth was hugely traumatic. And every year her birthdays have been hugely traumatic. And now she's died just near her birthday. And you read Romans 8, 28. All things work. Isn't it precious? I had no, I didn't know that was her birthday. I know you told me, but I knew the one that stuck in my head was the twenty second because I know every month, like with my grandpa when he died, always it was the thirtieth. Now it's July thirtieth. I, yeah. but in the beginning, every time it came around, every month that date is like, oh my god, it just knocks you. It hurts. Hey. And, yeah. Oh, I had no idea. See, that's one of the few that I will always remember because I 
put something practical with it. His mom and dad turned that into something important and made it a birth, you know, a, a wedding day. And I don't remember all the addresses. That's what they call it, the address. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. I know the verse, a lot of them, but I don't know the address. But there are some, and that's the most important one I remember. And then there's Matthew 7, 7, I'll never forget, ask. You can't get anything if you don't ask. The verse says, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and the door will be open. We've been asking, and he's been answering. The doors are open. I just gave you comfort that I had no idea I was giving. Because I happen to remember that one, where it was at. And that address was something that was very important to you. And I had no clue. Isn't it amazing? But I just comforted you through it. And oh, that's why I'm trying to make this so important to these guys. They might, they might not remember them like you didn't remember. It. I remember it because it just was important to me. And there's only a few. I think about all the verses. I was in a church where you had, to, they had something called sword drill. They would say the first words of a, of a verse and you had to find it. That's how hard it used to be. You didn't get the verse at and No, they said the verse and you had to. So we got that plowed in there. But all of them that we got plowed in there, most of where they are has faded. But the most important ones, they haven't. Ask, call. Um, what's the other one? Thy word is a lamp into my feet and a light into my path. Whenever, again, here you go. What is it? Say? Thy word a book has the answers it might not make a lot of sense but i'm reading out of the message now i'm on the bible.com it's one of the best websites i've ever found you can find daily reading plans you can pick one and say hey you want to join with me and have other people read with you you can get what ever version you if they've got it it's on there so lately i've been reading out of the message I know the King James. I can hear that in my head like somebody's repeating a record. But I never read the message before. Mm -hmm. And when I read it, it's common language. It's get down in the trenches real every day like you and I talk. Mm -hmm. And when I read it, it's like, this is what those guys need. They need it brought up for them. And they may never look at it yeah. until the day that they have nothing else to turn to. They're sitting in that motel room. Yeah. And that's all I want to tell them. that It's a source. And it's so verifiable. I, I know these people all, they hear this show, Zeitgeist, and all these things, these similarities, and astrotheology. Well, the Bible answers so many questions. It can be put in so many categories. It talks about astronomy. It talks about the Pleiades. It even uses the words that we use today. Yeah. Yes, we are affected by the stars. But everything you want to know is in that book. Yeah. It really is. It, ignore the history if you want to. That's the largest part of the Bible. And I think that's what turns people off. When you look at the Old Testament, you got this great big section. It's about stuff you don't care one bit about. Battles that happened when they were running around with horses and you know, okay, don't worry about them. I read them because there's value in them that I dig for. Yeah. The basic stuff, Psalms, the book of John. If you guys don't read anything, read the book of John. In the beginning was the Word, capital W. Jesus is the Word. So when you look at that book, yes, that book is the, it is the Word of God, but that represents the man, everything about Jesus, you will find in that book. It's there. And if you don't want to read that book, just remember you're giving up a valuable thousands of years that people, Victor Frankl, you know, what kept him going in the concentration camp? He was a Jew. He loved his Bible, and you could not take that away from him. He hid this text this book in his clothes and anywhere he could hide it to keep them from and now we have this the bible's the same way 
they took the books and they hid them in the mountains. And now we found the Nag Hammadi scrolls. We find scrolls everywhere. We go back and read it and it's like, I'll be damned. It says the same thing the other one did. And there's been professors and teachers, like I said, with Michael Heiser, they'll show you. There's a proof here. This was never changed. This was never changed. There's been versions that change it. But the source that it came from is not changed. It's and especially in the Old Testament, they counted every character. They would find where the middle was, make sure that the middle was. I mean, that book has been, God is all over that book. And that's why Israel existed. He made the people of the book. He said, you people are, are horrible, strong-headed, stubborn asses. But I'm using you to keep my book. That's what Israel's for. That's what they were. They brought us the book. And then Jesus came and his disciples brought it to us. My God, how can you take that and throw it in a trash can? I just, I know I'm going to face this down the road, which is why I'm talking about it right now. Oh, I'm going to hear it. Oh, did you read the Dhammapada? Did you read, you know, I've read Carlos Castaneda. I've read the Four Agreements. And you know what? They've all got the same thing in common. It's all about love. Yeah. But the Dhammapada was written in India for Indians. You know what I mean? I, I was raised with this. And I'm so sorry we did that. Like you said, we walked away from marriages and had divorce. We walked away from faith, too. I kept mine, but I didn't make sure that my kids kept it. And what they saw turned them off to what they did see. Mm -hmm. And I'm really, oh, it gets me so angry that we let it happen. Yeah. It really does. Hey. And I know that the church ruined it. They did a lot of bad things. <laughs> But the, the core, I don't care how many times people tell me, my knee is going to bow only to Jesus. You ain't going to get this knee to bow nobody else. You'll have to shoot me to get me on my knees to anybody else. And I want them to have that <clears throat> that I have. And I don't think you're going to get it without realizing that how many thousands of years people have made that choice. If we ever come to that point, I keep thinking this, and I know it's a what people will call a Debbie Downer, but I keep saying this, this is my hell to die on, because I heard this some, oh, I know, with Afghanistan, this is where empires go to die. So that's another one. This is, this is my hell to die on. This is the one place I will not stop. Yes. And yes. I, I hope that my firm commitment to it <sighs> makes an impact. Yes, you can walk away from the things that you don't understand, but find a version that you like. Mm. If you, I've got a Bible out in the car. It's only the New Testament, Psalms, and the Proverbs. If you don't like the Old Testament, I know it's hard to understand, but the New Testament isn't. It's really not. If you look at John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, his only only son. Can you imagine me giving up my son for anybody? He gave his son for the whole world. He gave his only begotten son that we could have everlasting life. What is wrong with that verse? There's nothing. All it does to me is, oh my God, you can't. I heard this whenever you read in the Bible where it says something, instead of reading it, safe, for God so loved me that he make it personal because he's going to. And I'm telling you people, these guys, my son, he knows that he's already realized and you've got to count on God and these other guys are too. They're going to figure it out. You're going to be in God's army. So when these tough times come, but you better be grounded. However you can do it, if just read a verse every once in a while. Proverbs, you know, Proverbs is all about wisdom. And you know what they say? They call wisdom a woman. She, she will be on the streets calling for you. Wisdom is also the Holy Spirit. And we've talked about this before. God isn't male. He's not female. He it's, I keep using these words. He's he. God is not us. <laughs> 
but he has things that that are like us and that holy spirit is the mama it's the love it's the where you're going to get your strength from And then the rest of it is dad saying, this is how to live. When I was in nursing school, I didn't graduate because I I did the books great. When it came to the blood and gore, that wasn't so great. But I remember the first thing we talked about was the dietary laws in the Bible. They still teach it in nursing school. That's how important it is. They know that that's the most clean way of eating there could possibly ever be. They'll teach you right now in nutrition. Read the Bible, it's got the answers. If you don't want to eat this, this, this is the reason why. You shouldn't eat shelf is because it can get poison. You shouldn't eat pigs because they can get triggered. We didn't know that when, when they wrote that. They didn't know it, but now we know. There are reasons, and it, it sounds like, don't do that. But you should look at it more as, hey, you know what? I think I figured out the right way. Try this. <laughs> exactly. 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 My mother said My mother often said, that, that, that you are you, the only Bible that some people will ever read. Ever read. And you know how you and I have talked about quantum entanglement before and how we have mm-hmm. a really interesting connection between the two of us, that we've been brought together by some force beyond us. We didn't go searching. We just – and we – anyway, so all those things. I read a – one of these nuclear physicist guys who said that from all his maths and from everything that he's figured out the thing that was the the primary thing at the beginning of all his equations is life equations is life and he thinks going back through all his calculations that life existed before the universe And everybody has this idea, this Darwin idea, about there was this universe and then life formed after the universe formed. And this quantum physicist guy said, from what he can see, life formed the universe and then life inhabited some parts of that universe. So I was thinking about it a lot and I was thinking about Life is a pretty brutal thing. It doesn't really have much morality in it. I mean, you've got the snakes that squeeze people to death, and there's all sorts of terrible brutality out there in life. Mm -hmm. You need something to balance life, to make life, I don't know, moral, is that the word? Kind, compassionate. And I thought the thing that... Reasonable. Yeah. The thing that we have is love. Love doesn't protect you from life, but when you love your children, you keep them away from that snake that's going to squeeze them to death or that lion that's going to bite their head off or that savage person that's going to cut your child's head off because of the God you believe in or whatever it is. And so it's almost as if when when you talk about God is love, If we were to replace every word, every time God was mentioned in the Bible or Jesus was mentioned in the Bible with the word love, then love came to us. Love came to save us. Love gives us salvation. Love shows us the way. And what do these young millennials love so much? The word that's their, their word is compassion. Yes. The word for people these days, have compassion, be careful, give the other guy his due. And so it's the words change through history. But the essential truth is there. And if you can look past Mm. the words of the King James or the this thing or the TV evangelists or two old women who've screwed their lives up royally and would like to tell people all the things that you shouldn't do because they've done it. Yeah, we're like, we can really tell you anything. <laughs> we're right <laughs> up there with the, <laughs> we're one of one, us. how to mess it up. We did it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but we know what held us through that too, don't we? Every right? single day, 
Every time that I was in the pickle, do you know who I turned to? God. And I told God how terrible he was and how he wasn't looking after me and how dare he let me get divorced. And I was his servant and he said he was going to protect me. And what has he protected me from? And, and all my ranting never made him leave me. Never. And I look, at the, I look back on my life now, those last 20 odd years of my life, and I see how close, how many times I um. was to being in terrible problems. I had this group of friends that I found out after a while were prostitutes. Oh, I've hung around people like that. Oh, I know, you've been with them. <laughs> they were saying to me, you should come out at night with us. <laughs> And I was like, oh, well, one day, yeah, I'll come out with you. And then I realized what they were doing when they were out at night. It wasn't going to the pub and dancing and playing karaoke. <laughs> oh, my God. I, I know, we're the least people to depend on for our past. I was in this room with this guy once, and some other guy came in and said, look, look, I got this for you. I got this for you. It's your Jew anyway, so it doesn't matter that I took it because you were Jew it and blah, blah, blah. And they sat down with this stuff and they put it in this little thing and they it was methamphetamine, man. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, I've been in all the same thing. It's happened to me, too. I don't even know what's going on. But, like, I look yeah. back at it now, now that I get the sort of life that I was living. Before, I was just in, I don't know if I call it denial or what. But like I said before, I was living in this world where I thought that I was doing so well and I was trying so hard and my yeah. life had gone wrong, but it didn't matter because I was doing the right thing. And I was hanging out with prostitutes and drug and, and, <laughs> and I think oh my God. No, God was with me. I used to hitchhike. Can you imagine what the heck was going on? But God, I remember one time, I'll have to tell you this story. I was not quite right because I'd had shock treatments and I was confused and I had this feeling that I should go to the state park. It was a place that I had all kinds of peace about and I had locked myself out of my house. I couldn't wake anybody up, but I had the keys to the car. I didn't have the keys to the house. I don't know how it happened, but that just happened and everybody was asleep and I decided I wanted to go to this lake well god must have been trying to stop me because i had the car keys but the car wouldn't start and i walked i decided to walk so i know he was with me through this i wasn't thinking logically mm. so i'm walking along the road and i'm hitchhiking because i did it when i was a teenager i'm like okay I, I, here i'm in my 30s with my brain scrambled hitchhiking this guy came pulled over in this big pickup truck and he says are you okay and i said I just know I've got to go to the state park. And he says, is there anybody there waiting for you? I said, no, but when daylight comes, I'll call my husband. I got locked out of my house and I don't know what to do. I'm just wanting to go to the only place I know where there's peace. This man, I could have trusted him with my life. And it just happened to be that was who came. I know God was watching over me. I could have been murdered that night. Yeah. I really could have been. Anybody when, got he was the only one. He took me right to this place, and it's a state park, and they've got a fish like where you can get uh, fish lures and fish. Uh, what do you call it? The bait. It was yeah, a bait yeah. shop, and he was already there. The guy was already there, and I went up to him and I said, "I'm locked out of my house." He was friends with my husband at the time, my third husband, and I said, "I didn't know what to do. I couldn't go back home." Uh, I couldn't get in, couldn't wake anybody up. So I came out here because it's the only place I know. And the guy said, come in here and sit with me. It was just like everything was just engineered. And then when daylight came, he had a phone. And I called my husband. He came out and got me. But can you imagine if I didn't have that faith and knowing God was why? I even realized it at the time. Oh, my God. This is all. I'm scared to death. But this guy got me here he took me to my husband's friend that has a shop here he's already here and all i have to do he just opened that road up right for me and you know it might not have ended that way but it might have been that maybe somebody was 
it could have been that I would have been murdered, but then God would have taken me home. But that's not what happened. He, he, he protected me, right? And that's not the only time. I can tell you so many. Like when I was in the um, unwed, not unwed, uh, married, uh, about abused women's shelter for married. It was all us married women. Or back then, everybody was married. There weren't boyfriends and girlfriends so much. This was yeah. 1975. You know, yeah. there was a few, but we were all mostly married, and we were scared half to death. Yep. And this place had nuns, and those nuns, they prayed because we were always afraid that our husbands would find out where we were. Word would get out. They'd find the shelter. Then they'd have to move the shelter. You know, it was just over and over. This happens. And these nuns were praying, protect these people here with us. Protect these women. And the police would even come and knock on the door. And one of them was a police chaplain. He came to the door one night and he said, I just want to come by and tell you. And he came in and talked to all of us. We were all down in the living room because you had to be in this group at night. He walked in and he said, ladies, I want you to know. I believe in God, and I think God is wanting that I will make sure you're protected. And I am the captain of this group, and we are circling this neighborhood. You are being watched over. Don't be afraid. And he even told them if they, we all worked almost all of us during the day. He said, if you're afraid to go out to your car, call us. We will come here, and we will take you to your car. Wow. How lucky could I get that I go to a place where there's nuns and there's police that believe in God and are like these older dark nights. Already in my youth, they were there. I, I, there's so many of them. My best man in my first wedding, he was, I know God put thoughts in his head to tell me. He told me before I got married, do you really want to marry this guy? He wanted, I don't, I didn't know this at the time. He loved me to death. He wanted to marry me. I had no idea. He wouldn't because it was his best friend. He was not going to take his best friend's girlfriend. But he was there for me. He knew my husband was mean. And he's like, do you really want to do this? I mean, God's been everywhere. And if you turn around and look back in your life and you think of some of those really horrible moments, for me, I can point, yep, he pulled me through that one. Yep, he got me there. Yep. Strange, hey? And and it's strange also how you're not always, you, you're not aware of it in the moment. I mean, you can, you can be. but Sometimes so I often, am, but most of the time I'm not. So often, and so often it comes through somebody else who's there for you. Well, it was for me. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I know now, looking back over the last few decades, I thought that I was doing well, and maybe I was doing the best that I could. But the best that I could sucks. Yep. And now, and now I'm at this place where I can finally start seeing it, and I can see that I'm, I was always having my battles with God. I was never acknowledging God. I was never submitting to love. I was sure nobody could love me. I was unlovable, I was all those things that you get when you get abused, you know, and um, and I thought that God had left me, I thought that I was somehow unworthy, you know? Mm -hmm. And I went through that because yeah. we think of God as a man, don't we? We think of a, a like a dad, a father, yeah. like, yeah. yeah. And it's, but he's not. It's really hard when, you, when you're in those issues and when, I think, I think that what I think that what the world has lost sight of is how vulnerable women feel. I yeah. think we know we're softer, we know we're weaker. And there and and we're not tough. I mean, we're not weak. We are tough. We can do unbelievable things. Like I mentioned my sister bringing up two children on her own. So. And working in a high-powered job and being the most lovely mother and neighbor and she's tough. She's also a woman. She also mm -hmm. needs more than, you know, we need that community, community, community. Mm -hmm. And community isn't made, I think, was it you that I said too, that 
I think I was telling of that experiment that I found out. I hope I hadn't said this last week. I'll have to cut it out if I did. There was an experiment where they uh, they checked on f families, families that have more than five girls. Yes, you mentioned it. Say it again. It's important. Where there is a family where there are five five siblings that are all girls, the chance of having a mental illness develop in those children is huge. It's like something stupid like 80%. If you have those same five children, but one of them is a boy, that chance of there being mental illness among that group of siblings crashes down to about 10% or something. And we have this situation here where we've got this division, the left and right, mm -hmm. the blue and red, the girl and boy. And so the really interesting thing is how so many of the guys are saying feminists are insane and uh, the left, the left has Trump derangement syndrome. I don't know what the left says about us, so us conservative guys. I bet you there's something about us being quite insane. Oh yeah. Anyway, the thing is, the point that I'm trying to make <laughs> after 20 minutes, the thing is that men stabilize women. Yes. We've been through these lives without men or without being able to trust men or having men that we trusted turn on us and physically make our lives worse. And all along, the secret for mental health is a guy protecting the girls just by the essence of being male. I mean, a baby boy is born into a family and suddenly without him doing anything, the chances of mental illness. Isn't that just a miracle? And I yes, have the same problem with it's you about, balanced. yeah. I have the problem with you, <laughs> the same problem as you about saying God, he, God, he. I don't want to say God, she either because there was just as, and yet, God is human. But, God is God. And, and God encapsulates the male essence and the female essence, I believe. Oh, and that is why it's godly, because you have that total balance. And here on earth, we've got this division. This division has become horrendous. And the oh, price we're God. paying for allowing God to fade out of our lives is this. This is the replacement. This is what life is without God. The wrong world is what happens when you drive God out. Yeah. yeah. And you look at those people over in Afghanistan, the Taliban, those religious extremists. All these years we were over there fighting them, and they had that. Honestly, I know they're sick, and I know a lot of the things they believe are horrible, but they have faith. My God, do they have faith. They're like, we're going to beat you people because our God says so. Yeah, you know, it's weird. All those years, how many empires have gone there and died because the Afghanis, because that's their land and they have a deep faith in you. Just imagine if we had that kind of faith as Christians. I, there, again, that word Christian, that's why I use the power of the way. There's so much, and that's not in the Muslim faith. They don't have that. Oh, you shouldn't say that in Muslim. They do have their divisions, and they don't all get along, the Sharia, the Sunni, all that. Well, we've all got that, too. But, boy, if it's in the book, they're like, yep. Some of them are a little bit more aggressive about what's in the book, and some are less aggressive about it in the book. But they agree on the book. And we fight. Oh, gosh. Christianity. And that's what a terrible example. Yes. And I think that's the really hard thing. I think that's a really hard thing. You look through the Old Testament and you see that everybody who made it in the Old Testament lived the most hideous lives. They lied, mm -hmm. they manipulated, they stole, they murdered, they murdered other people, they, they took their women. They David, the apple of the Horrible people. Yeah. Kill the man for his wife. But Jesus said if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, 
You can move a mountain. I don't know. I might be completely missing up those quotes. No, it says, yeah, it says exactly that. And you know what? I I heard something about that I think is important right now. I've, I've heard these things over my years, and sometimes they're not important. But right now, it just hit me. If you live in the Middle East, mustard is common. It's it's everywhere, like tumbleweeds out west or right. crabgrass. And, okay? It is just ubiquitous in the Middle East. So when Jesus said a small little mustard seed, it also says something about it'll, be grow, it'll grow to be a tree that birds can nest in. That's how big it can get. He made something so clear to them because they knew what a mustard seed could do. They knew it was a tiny, you could hardly see the little thing, but when it grows, you can have a tree. So it made sense. It, it clicks in your head now. And if we just, little things like that, if we make it more current, I understand it because I studied, I, I'm a teacher, and that was something that was important to me. I, oh, oh research, ah, you know, so that sounds good. But now it's making sense because they understood what he was saying. Yes. And he, everybody, they get upset when they read the Bible because it's in parables and stories. Jesus said when he told those parables, I'm telling these people parables because they're not going to understand. I'm telling these parables for you because you'll understand what I'm saying. And after he told the crowd, they're like, oh, wow, that's really interesting. He take his guys, his buddies, Mary Magdalene, and all the women that had supported him. It was not just men. It was a bunch of men, women, children, I'm sure they had. He took them aside and he says, okay, this was the parable. This is how I told it to them. Now I'm going to tell you. I said this parable about the vineyard, and the guy sent his son to take care of his vineyard and sent him there, and they sent him back and said, no, sorry, I'm not going to give you our money or our crop for this year. So he sends him back again, and they, they're even worse, sends him back one more time, and they kill him. Oh, my God. Does that make it clear to you? God sent Jesus to you. And what did you do? You killed him. He was telling them in ways so it would be so clear to them. And as I'm saying, I'm thinking, oh, my God, this is what I'm supposed to do. I'm sp supposed to tell you guys that it doesn't make sense because you don't know who he is. You aren't taking that book and reading it and going, can you explain? I mean, literally, God will make things clear fit for you if you ask him. If you read something, you're like, what? I don't get this. I know because I've been through it and seen it happen. I'd look at something and this is tough. I can't believe this. For example, submit yourself to your husbands. Oh my God, how did our generation hate that? But they didn't read the other half. It tells the husband to live for your life and die for her. Yeah, we're supposed to, because he's taking care of us and I know things have gotten out of whack and men got confused and we got confused, but he's our protect. They were there to protect us. And it's not there to knock you over the head. Yes, I'm the boss. Mm -hmm. Don't look at it that way. Again, you said to replace that word with love. Well, the men are our earthly representation of God because God's the father and our men are our fathers and our husbands. So they're the ones they're responsible for us, and that's a heavy, heavy burden. But we, if we give ourselves and be kind and love our husbands, they're going to cherish us. And literally, I know all three of my husbands, as messed up as all three of them were, and as messed up as I was, only one's left alive. But I can tell you right now to this day, if I called him and said something's wrong, he's only got one leg, but he'd get over here and he'd do something. Dang about it. Because he... That's their job, and we've we've divided us all so much. And I know this is just you and me talking, but I'm not going to keep. We're going to have men and women here. Yeah. And this is our show, so we'll tell the men what we want, and we'll tell them what we don't want because it's our show. But I do want them to come and balance us. Yes. And even the ones that aren't here like right now the one i talked to yesterday says i'm listening he went and listened to his show because i said we mentioned you and he went and listened to it 
they and they're there they he understood the phrase when i said we call you dark nights he's like oh that makes sense we've all been hurt and we're we've got things that aren't but we're nights oh and this guy's the most perfect guy to call a knight uh. he's so stuff he's so armor oh Amazing. Talk about god just bringing people to say here you go here's another guy he's here for you mm. Mm. and mm. we're just fighting and it's like oh please guys let's come together let's mm. let's bury the hatchet not in each other let's go throw it out there on the tree stump and come back and try to start this all over again and all this anger we have with each other. I know I'm angry. I used to be. I was angry with God, angry with men, angry with me, angry, 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 angry. Yeah. But if we stop and go, God, you know what? <laughs> what works? Love. And who's the author of love? Like you said, they, they've, they're starting to realize that this world was made. It's, it was made. It's I'll not an love. accident. Yeah. <laughs> And we've taken it like, go ahead. A lot of the, a lot of the, the um, argument, maybe, or the discussion or the debate that's happening in society about this division between men and women seems to center, center around a hierarchy structure versus a network structure. And initially when mm -hmm. we heard the argument for a network, because, I mean, I grew up in hierarchy. We were in a, a, a country at war. The men were super important. They were fighting. We were at home with our mothers and brothers and sisters. And I mean, I, 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 as the eldest child, when my dad was out in the army, it fell to me to be the one. Mm -hmm. Just that's how it goes. Anywho, the thing was that I grew up with this hierarchical structure, and I, I didn't know that it was that there was an, another option. Came over mm -hmm. here to New Zealand, which is so strongly feminist, so strongly feminist, so socialist, and really, really interested to see. And I learned about the, the, the feminism here. I'd, I'd never studied feminism before. This is, say, maybe 10, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, really found this, this argument against hierarchy to be very compelling, right? Right. And then found that I wanted to throw the hierarchy out because I thought network was so good. And now, very recently, in the last few years, I've realized neither of them are going to work. Mm -hmm. You have to have both of them. You have to have hierarchies of men doing what men do in the men world that I don't want to know anything about, and they actually don't want us to know anything about. That's their business. Where they That's can be as cutthroat and uh, and vicious and abominable and rude and non politically correct, and then there's us. We want to talk to each other. We want our children not to bite each other and kick <laughs> each other and smack each other on the nose. We just and and both things that are opposites have to. Okay, it's not join because you can't join opposites, but they have to come together to be able to work as one, to balance each other and to be. And yeah, so that's my uh, my sort of uh, opinion now that mm -hmm. God was both. God is three. God is the father. God yeah. is the son. God is the spirit or the mother or whatever. We have this whole family structure, three different types of, of love or of life or of stuff all joined together as one God. Doesn't right. that show us that as above, so below? We should be yes. three but one. This is the whole thing. We have women being women and men being men and everything together that comes together to make... Anyway, that's my, my, that's my ideal world. So and what we forgot in that, the men went and went to be men and we went to be women, but we got to get back together. Yeah, we we to have to. Together. And it doesn't mean we have to come back the old way. Yeah, the hierarchy does have to be, there has to be structure. Like I told you when we were talking, I'm the spontaneous one, you're the prepper. You, you've got to have these two, there's got to be, 
that core thing that you can count on underneath. And the men have provided that. They've, they've made this society, this world that we have, this amazing, these men, what they've made for us, all these technical genius things. And we women, we've done our part. You know, I think about, I, there's a group of Indians, I can't remember which group, but the United States, uh, the eagle that holds those mm -hmm. arrows in its hand, it was a group of Native Americans that had their own structure and they decided the women were just as important as the men. They, they had like a council. The men were in charge, but they listened to the women mm -hmm. and they saw it that way, that they were a conglomerate, that they would gather together and they, mm -hmm. they stuck through that way. And it's a really good example for like what I think our future should be. We'll be completely women and they can be completely men, but we have to get this core of us back together. And it's not going to come back together without love. And it's love with a capital O. We pulled love out. Of, when you take the Bible out of school, when you take prayer out, when you don't go to any semblance of gathering between each other. That doesn't mean you have to go to a building, but you we've lost that community. It's not the old folks, yeah, the 60s and over, they're over there in church, right? You know, they were there today, but we've lost it. Yeah. Somehow we have to rebuild. We have to come together and realize, mm -hmm. you guys, you realize how awful it is. You really want to live your life all by yourself, men going their own way. Do you really like that? Mm -hmm. And women out there with your job and career, do you really like having to go to work every day and not have any kids come home to at night or a man to hug you? Are you really happy that way? I don't think any of us are. I, I know I've known a couple of these MIG toe guys. They are freaking miserable. They literally hate women. They've gotten to that point, a lot of them, not all. But the, they've turned their back is the way to put it. Stop trying. Stop here. Yeah. And they're so afraid of us. Yeah. They are deathly afraid of us. Deathly. And all I want to tell them is, you know what? You young women, you young men, the, the young men out there are just begging for you to be women. They want women to love. And you're acting like, oh, we don't need you. And so what they do, they walked off. And you are, I know my neither of my, any of my husbands were not good. I had three of them. I failed three times miserably because we were both broken but you know when I look back at it the best times in my life were when I was with the man I loved there was only one of the three that I really really loved and I think about those are the best days of my life the day I have a picture I'll have to show maybe one of these days of my son Justin it was his first bath at home and I have the picture of his dad washing it so still and the smile on his face and that baby and I look at that and I go oh my god those were the good times and I looked at when I when that happened I was so miserably ill I'd almost died the baby had almost died things were horrible if you talk about we were broke you know everything but we had a beautiful baby and he loved that baby. He loved me. I remember when the baby was born. I didn't know if it was male or female. I didn't have to know. He's it's a boy. It's a boy. That joy. Yes, we're not perfect, but we're not going to be able to come back together if we don't have the spirit in between. Yeah. Like God has the father and the son, and that spirit is in the middle, and we call that the the mother, the woman. But it's the it's the glue. It's the glue that holds it all together. We mothers, we have that love. That's what mothers are. I know a lot of women today have lost it because they didn't learn how to be mothers. But mothers, if you don't think of love when you think you're a mom. I know my mom, with the way we had such differences in her family being recreated, I thought, I used to think, wow, what a mom. But I look back at it and I think all the things she did. My mom was all about love. She she did the best she could. Like, I know that doesn't sound satisfactory, but it's a fact. That's what it is. We've, all, yeah. we've all done the best we could, but we're leaving a, the main part out. Yeah. The spirit. You can try to bring these nicktoe guys and these 
feminine women back together all you want, but if they don't have the spirit, it's not going to work. That's right. That's right. Because and you can't put in your own strength. As a human being, you can't, and I think that's what you and I can testify to, that we tried to mm -hmm. do it, and it's not possible. Do you, you in, the Sh in the Star Shatter series, Arag Mars books, mm -hmm. I think it's in the, the third or fourth book, he uses the terms the golden age of women. And he talks about mm -hmm. how, you remember? He talks mm -hmm. about how women had everything laid on. They had these homes full of servants. They had the children who had governesses. They basically, their job was to get up and float around the house and tell the servants what to do and snuggle with their kids. And that was what women had. And they said, no, actually, we don't like this. Let's have jobs. Yeah. And how did that work out? You know? So mm -hmm. uh, the golden age of women, it's definitely, we, we didn't know how to be grateful. Okay, so things had gone wrong with men, and there were a lot of women that were bitterly, bitterly unhappy, and abuse was terrible, marital rape was terrible, child abuse was hideous. There, there are reasons, and I'm yeah. not negating the, the feminist movement. I think it did a huge oh. amount for justice, and it brought this problem of abuse out into the open. Which, is, And we haven't solved that. We haven't solved that problem. Women mm. need to be powerful. They need to have their own efficacy and have their own way in life. Men need to be able to call the shots for themselves and not have somebody telling them, don't do this, don't do that, don't do the next thing, you can't turn around, you're wrong. But I think that you and I are saying we didn't get it right. We don't know how to even get it right, possibly. No. But we do have the Bible, we do have our experience, and we do have this hope that you and I have encountered in finding these dark nights. Mm -hmm. We just stumbled onto them. It's as if they went off, they walked away from us, they jumped onto the internet, and they built themselves communities where they didn't have to be belittled and undermined. And now mm -hmm. they have these wonderful communities of men, strong, caring, gentle, unbelievably sweet men. Yeah. Without them. And I know that I have had moments, years of being in love, being in a wonderful place, and it went away. But like you say, those times when it worked. Oh, man, we got that glimpse of heaven. Yeah, oh, a glimpse of heaven. I, that was what I think got me that day. I put a post up on mine. I said, I'm I'm putting this thing together. I've got the, it's on your own floor right now. I got this scrapbook. And I was going to put all these pictures my mom had. And they're not just of mom. It's all family. Family. Me. All of us, my pictures of our, all of us that we didn't have anymore, that we had sent to her and we lost ours. And I couldn't do it. I just, because I remembered, oh my God, those were the most special days. And when I go back and I look at them, it hurts every time because yeah. it's gone. I lost it because of, oh, like you said, we were given terrible advice. Terrible advice. And I really don't know how this generation is going to figure it out. But, God, if this, if there's anything going to last of the human race. And, honestly, even if the world ends, we're still going to be men and women. Whatever we are, souls, we're male, female. That's going to be forever. We've got to figure out how to live together. Yeah. And we're not going to be able to do it without that balance in between the structure underneath, underneath, and the answer is we've been turning our back on love. Everything had to be, oh, women, go get your career. You'll have more money that way. You'll be able to take care of your family. Yeah, you can be with your husband. You can both have careers. You can have your 
cake and eat it too. Guess what? Baloney. I went through it. I was one of those that I didn't want to be dragged into this. I wanted to stay home with my kids, and we did. I mean, my husband, he was in the Navy. He didn't make great money. His highest rank was first-class petty officer. But we tried. He was only a third-class petty officer when my son was born. And I stayed home till that boy was 27 months old. Don't tell me you can't do it. We were poor as dirt. Yeah. But that boy, we loved that boy. And when he came home from work, well, all we were focused on was that boy. And I was home with that kiddo. And he told me he wanted me home because he knew he was had he was adopted, but his parents, his mother was there. And that was that was just the way it was gonna be. Dad was not she did later when they were older. She was the organist of the church. She became a secretary, but she had a role, but when those kids were little, she was with them. And I did that with mine until my daughter was born when Justin was 27 months old. Things got tight then. Now you got two babies. Now you got doubled. And it got where we just couldn't do it anymore. I mean, we really tried. So I started out with little part times. There's ways to get around this is what I'm trying to say. You can work at home. I had yes. little part-time evening jobs where I worked four or five hours and he took care of the kids. There's always ways that you can figure it out. But I think I know Sweden for a while was doing this thing where mothers were getting paid to stay home. I maybe we need to do that. I think that's a get wonderful back. idea. I think that's a wonderful idea to allow women to provide women with financial freedom. It takes the pressure off the man from having to provide for his family and and it takes the pressure off the woman. She doesn't need to go and work. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is that when women are younger, we were talking earlier about the emotions. When women are younger and they're having babies, they have to have hormones and the hormones really mess with your ability to, well, to be rational all the time. Yeah. However, we get to 45 and our childbearing years are over, our hormones die down, and we can have the most amazing careers. Mm -hmm. We don't need to do it both at the same time. Ah! Why yeah, was I I've had but wonderful I it. Yeah, I didn't I never got my college degree, but I've done things that I wanted to do. I've done one I've had so many lives. I've I've done so many things. But when my kids were babies, even when my daughter was born, I was only home with her for about three weeks because she was really late and I was already off work. So I only had so long I could take. I went back to work when my daughter was three weeks old. But guess who was taking care of her when I was at work? Daddy. Yeah. Daddy was with them. Yeah. And I come home and tuck them in bed at night. We, we worked it out. Yes. And that's why I would tell these young people today, don't give up on, you might not like how we did marriage. You might want to do it differently. Who says you have to have a, a piece of paper that says you're married? When did that start? That's the state that does that crap. A church might give you a certificate, yes. but the whole point is that you come together and you agree, I want to be with you. You want to be with me. I love you dearly and I want to have children. That is the core of what's kept this humanity alive for hundreds of thousands thousands of years is this family unit and if we keep if women keep going this way and guys where are the babies being made and the ones that are being made they're being aborted because the women say i don't have any men to take care of me what am i going to do and they're committing honestly i'll tell you this is something i'm i'm going to tell you right out flat i had an abortion once mm -hmm. It was a therapeutic abortion. I was bleeding half to death. And I was so poor, I didn't have the money to go to a good obstetrician. So I went to Planned Parenthood. I hate Planned Parenthood to death. But I'm telling you that this shows I'm, no, I'm not a perfect person. I was in trouble with that baby. And it, maybe if I had a good doctor, I could have hung on to it. I had no choice. I was poor. I had a job with no insurance. I had to go get a literal, a therapeutic abortion, but it was still an abortion. It might have been saved if I'd had a husband 
I had to walk away from that husband because he was the violent one, okay? I had no choice because there was no support, no help for me. And we women could be here for, like you were saying, if we're going to have to reform everything. Government is, just nothing is right. We need to support this, the family. The family is the core, not government. Government should be there to protect the borders, to protect the nation, and get the f out of our personal lives. Yep. You know? Yep. And when we're spending all this money on NATO and Europe, we've got our country falling apart around us. This money should be going to our families. It should be helping our women to stay at home. Yes. For the women that do decide to work, there should be excellent daycare. When you have to work, if you do have a husband who died, you should be able to say, I know these kids are going to be taken as, care, as good a care of as my mother could take care of them. You know, a lot of us don't have support. Our kids are, there's no grandmothers, no, no husband. Our society should be protecting us. The money should go back into who, what made us. Why are we send, spending money on war for everybody else? <laughs> but I do feel sometimes, I do really feel that it's more than just a small problem. Mm, it's a huge one. I don't think, honestly, these people that are in charge that have a good heart, I shouldn't say, the people that are in Congress and any what, whatever your government and your country is, they should be your servants. I'm sick of saying in charge of us. They're supposed to be helping us. But anyway, these people, we've let them, with our apathy, think that they rule everything. Well, sorry, dudes. We put you, sorry, we put you there, and this is a mess. Mess. And government, honestly, that's a man's thing. You know, in the beginning, when this country was made, women didn't vote. You know why? Because men knew what women were like. They're like, oh, do we really want to let them decide this? Sorry, government was made by men, for men, and women can have a role in it. Oh, yeah. Okay. But do you really think it's a good thing to have women rule in the world? I'm a woman, and honestly, if I had that nuclear code and I was pissed at the guy, I can just see myself. Going, but do you see a man doing that? Yeah. Honestly, man, we have to get back to common sense. Mm -hmm. We women were made to take care of children and love men. Why do we hate those things? Yeah. We were taught yeah. to hate that. We I mean, were, I, we were. just in those girls that said, I don't want kids. I want a career. I don't want to marry you. I want to go to college. And, he, you know, those young guys, they get out of high school and they get their, their first little bit of money. They come up to the girl, hey, honey, I got a ring. It's just, nope, sorry. Can you imagine what that does to a guy? Oh, I just, I want to go to college. I don't need you. And then by the time they get out of college, they look at that guy that loved him. I don't want him. I'm going to save and wait for this rich guy. And in the meantime, nobody has any kids. Nothing's out ever. And all the joy that they could have, they think that career is important. I read something the other day about people in their last days of life. You know what people think about the last minutes of their life? It's not about how great your job was or how many places you've been, how much money you have. No. You know what you think about? The people that love you, the people that you love. You don't give a flying leap about how much money's in the bank when you're about to die. You don't. Yeah. Like I have that perfect example when my mother was dying. She would not die. I swear that woman stayed alive until... She wanted to see me. What was most important in her last, most extreme moments? Her family. Why the, why did we walk away from that? Well, Satan got yes. Yes. into us. And he, yeah, woman, he, he, he tempted Eve. He tempted Eve. And Adam was so polite, he stepped back and said, all right, Eve, you want your chance? Go ahead. You know, we understand. And now, and, and you know the other thing that's quite cute, you mentioned um, Jordan Peterson earlier and how he'd been such a wonderful 
morale officer to yes Aragmas terms morale officer perfect words and before he before he wrote the 12 rules for life he wrote maps for of meaning and it's all based on christianity it's all based on biblical teachings and these huge great uh, dramas that play out in the Bible, that play out in our lives. Everyone's lives. Everyone's lives. And you can look at yourself and you can see moments where you can identify with Jesus. And you can look at yourself and see moments that you identify with Moses. Or you can look at yourself and say, oh yeah, like I do, Mary Magdalene, you know. <laughs> oh, goodness, yes. I, I yeah. really, really identify with her suffering. And like I, do. I, I feel like I'm Mary Magdalene right now. That's what I think my stage of life is. I am an older woman. I don't have a husband. So my total commitment is to God. Yeah. It's all, if he was standing here in the flesh, I'd be sitting at his feet. It's yeah. all I can. I have my family, yes, but he is like, ugh. So Mary Magdalene is who I am right now. And that wasn't always who I was. I had a husband. I was a daughter. Or, but now... And that's what my job is, to show people that, wow, he's so much loved. And Jesus was a man. He was a man. And he came. A lot of people say that he got married. I really don't think he ever did. I, don't think I, I know they say rabbis did, but I, he had so many women around him. But his goal was not, even though that was what he wanted for us, mm -hmm. his goal was to come here to do his job. He knew it from the get-go that he was going to be sacrificed yes and those women were there for his comfort mm -hmm. and we are not comforting our men's like our men like they did Jesus and I think oh my god what a perfect example the women that that followed him the one the ones that had the deep pockets Mary Magdalene from what I understand was probably a widow with some money yeah. and it wasn't yeah. just her there was a lot of women around it yeah. and we need to Oh gosh, if we could love our men like they love Jesus. Yes. Oh yes. my God. Yes. Don't be a Martha. Be a Mary. Find, oh, if I could just. I'm going to have to record some of these special moments I have because they happen. If you can just say, God, show yourself to me and really mean it. Say, God, I need to know you're up there. Are you real? I remember you were talking about being angry. I remember there was times I was, wasn't sure he was up there. It was like I couldn't hear him talk and I couldn't feel nothing, but I was just angry. And I just, mm -hmm. ah, you know, that kind of, mm. yes. and you know yes. what he did? He didn't get angry at me. I felt this love on my, whenever I had those moments, somebody would come along. I can't count how many times somebody at church would give me a gift that was, here you go. And I, it's like Jesus said, here, you go. I'm giving you these people to make you feel better. And I, I keep looking at this, all this anger I had and all this love coming back at me. He doesn't, God's not, we compare him with our earthly fathers, him. God is not like that. God, yes, he, there's things that happen to us and it's because God got tired of putting up with us and God stomps that foot and says, nope, no more. But God isn't like an earthly father. His God's only purpose is to love you. He will run, literally run after you. I God did that to me. I said, Sayonara, get lost. You treated me terrible. You weren't there when I wanted you. And then I turn around and look, oh my God, God was there. He sent them. God sent them. And I've been screaming at him the whole time. And all he's doing is, here, I'm right here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if yeah. I don't tell you guys anything, if anybody out there listens to this, this one thing I want you to know, call on it, on God and demand an answer. I mean, go out. If you don't get it the first day, say, I want to know you're there. Show me. I can guarantee you, you God will. God isn't a he. God isn't your dad that you hate. God isn't your mother that you can't stand. God isn't Mother Earth. 
God is God and God is more than your dad, your mom, everybody combined it. God loves you more than any mother, father you could ever imagine. And he, God is not here to make you hurt, but he, God will, because he does, God does have to correct you. I'm going to quit saying he, there are times, you know what it's like when your, your kids get in trouble. Okay. You're grounded. You're not going there. Right. Well, well, so God will do that because God loves you. He's God is going to say, nope, don't do that or you're going to get hurt. But you know what? When we go ahead and do it and we're laying on the floor going, oh, sh man, did I screw up? Does God say, oh, oh I'm, I'm done with you? No. God says, come here. I know it for a fact. And if you don't understand God, this might not work for everybody, but I'll tell you how it works for me. When I, I go outside on the porch and I lay in the sun, that's my thing. The sun to me is life and it's almost as important. It, it's God put that there, right? But when I see that sun, I think of God because in the Bible, it says the sun of righteousness and it doesn't spell it S-O-N, it spells it S-U-N. Something about the sun is related to God. So there's something important about that. But I get out there and I say, God, I want to be really close to you. And I use Christian phrases that I'm not going to say because, mm -hmm. but I say, I want to come where you are. I want to come up there with you. I want you to be with me all. And God will do that for you. He will. Now I say it in a way because I was trained this way. We are imperfect and God doesn't like looking at sin, but we are covered with the blood of God. Jesus Christ. We don't have to worry about our sin. He, God doesn't see it. He, God sees the blood of the only son. And he says, I gave that child for you and you're now covered with it. And I can accept you, even though you're not perfect. I gave you the way to come to me. And all you got to say is, how oh, man am I screwed up? I give up. Take over. That's why I, I literally did that. I went sat outside on my porch and said, I can't do it. I don't know what I'm doing. I give up. I surrender. I literally say that. I surrender. I did it wrong. And if I listen to that, and it's it can be a voice. It could be a piece of paper like I did with you today with Romans 8, 28. It could be anything. You can pick up a newspaper and it'll come right out at your face. I love you. I swear to heaven. If you will give it a shot and really, really be looking, there is no way you won't get an answer. And if you go out there and you tell me, I, I tried, I didn't hear nothing, then you were doubting because you weren't given a chance. I know it for myself because I literally walked away. I, I said, you messed my life up. God didn't mess my life up. I messed my life up. Yeah. Honestly, yeah. I think people say God ordered this, God did that. Mm -hmm. We did it to ourselves. We were hard headed and went off and did, and then we blame him, blame God. Why? Yeah, we did it. That's the unjust. That's the unjust. <laughs> unjust. I think that I think one of the things that you said earlier was that um, in God's love, uh, He will. God will reach us. I read recently something that absolutely gobsmacked me. I read the sentence that said, God is not loving. And I just sat there and I looked at it and I couldn't I couldn't believe it. I couldn't read any more. And then I thought, no, this is rubbish. I've got to read what this guy is saying. And the second sent sentence was, God is love. God <laughs> is not loving. God is love. When we're connecting with love and when we're reaching out to love, we don't need to get confused with the words. We don't need to worry about whether it's Allah or God or Jehovah or fight about the name. The Old Testament says so many times God doesn't have a name and yet we've got to fight about the name. And we talked about the other book that we were going to be looking at this resilient grieving 
there's also the, the Victor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning. And one of the mm -hmm. things he makes so clear when he's talking about the prisoners of war and the terrible conditions that they lived in, he, ch he describes people who were awful and who just brought other people down with their anger and their misery and how they would, they would team up with the guards to hand the other prisoners in and all these horrible things that people did in the camps because they were driven to these extremes. And then he also, in the middle of telling those stories, tells the stories of these amazing, wonderful people who put others before them, who didn't let the camp conditions make them change, make them be nasty. And to me, that's the, the real central thing. God is love. Love is love. Live lovingly. Live with compassion. Live with the conviction of compassion. Live reaching out to other people, bringing them in, learning, learning the stuff. There's never that amount of loving that you can be, that you become love. Only God can be love. We can try yes. and be loving. We can try and imitate him. And uh, I think I'm, in thinking those things, I'm starting to think forward. And I'm starting to think forward of this week that we're going to have to go into now coming. And I'm wondering, I'm sort of wondering to myself, what, what is the attitude that we could take away from today that would give us the most enthusiasm for the week. I'm going back to Chris again. Chris do good again. And did you leave us with that cliffhanger? Yeah. <laughs> and Chris, thinking, sorry, we're making an example of you. We love you so much. We love you. Yes. So awesome. We're hoping you're it's going to come so on. so encouraging to me from the get-go, by the way. So great. Yeah. Always. Yes. So. Even <laughs> Looking forward towards the rest of the week, what do you think that our priority and our focus should be as you and me and as you and me as part of a community and as a community? What's your opinion? I think we should start paying attention to what worked during the week. Like you were saying in the beginning, what happened between last week and this week? Well, I found out that people love me for one thing and that there is a tribe of us that love each other. And what did that bring me? I keep coming back to this word, gratitude, gratitude. Yes, I've been through a horrible week, pain, crying. Oh my God. When I was working on the scrapbook and looking through the pieces, I showed Lucas his grandfather's funeral paper. I started crying. I hardly even knew the guy, but just, it was something emotional about there's another person that's not with us and we want to remember. But the, the thing that overcame is he got to know his grandpa. He knows who his grandpa was. I want to take from, I, this is Sunday. It's the first day of the week. I know everybody thinks it's the last day. Sunday's the first day of the week. We need to really get back to what's really important. It's the, it, this is the beginning, okay? I, I'm so glad we made this on Sunday. Isn't it great? So, yeah, so I would tell you, and I'm going to remind me and everybody listening out there, when you have something good happen, carry that. Like, you know, Mary pondered it in her heart, that phrase. Carry those good moments because there's going to be dark days coming. I know this has been a dark time for me, even though there's good things. That ha it's been a really dark time, losing two people that were the, the rock of my life, you know. Yes. But I'm so, oh my God, my, I told you how they said us up. I'm going to have a deck built and I'm going to have something out there. I can say, my mama and my daddy, this whole house is because of them. And now I'm going to have something I can love and I'm going to cherish. That's the word. Cherish. Be grateful. Count every good thing you can find. There's a, a dark night. I'm not going to say his name again. This man, he has horrible pain. He won't tell people about it online unless he can go to a pride. He won't tell you in comments because he doesn't want people to see that weakness in him. But that man loves his wife. He is so grateful. 
that he's got. I want you guys out there, and I know I'm looking at just Bob Dub, but think of me talking to you, okay? I'm asking you to pay attention this week and ask God to show you gratitude, to show you moments that you can carry. Because when those people are sick in the hospital or you're in war, I, I think we're going, some of us are going to get separated somewhere down the road. Jeez. And that person isn't with you. You're going to want to go back to those days. Like we were saying earlier, what was the most precious thing in your this week? Find every day. Just one thing. If you can only find one thing, say, thank you because this happened. I go outside. The reason why I chose that, when I go outside and I pray, I, I know people don't like all these Christian words. I talk to God, okay? And the most things I say, thank you. This house, this the railing that I have to, to take my um, wheelchair down is already built before I even needed it. I didn't pay a penny for it. A place around here that does wheelchair ramps, put it up for free. And I go out there, I'm grateful for this railing. I'm grateful for this house. I'm grateful for the beds in it. I'm grateful for my neighbor's house is right next door. I'm grateful for my neighbor. I'm grateful for my paid off car. It might be 10 years old, 11 years, but I'm grateful. I'm grateful that I come in my house and there's air conditioning. And in the winter, there's heat. And there's hot and cold water right at my fingertips. And not only that, I've got a son that loves me so much, he would literally die for me right now if he had to. And a grandson that he worships the, every step I take. How blessed am I? And I can go to days that are bad, okay? Let's go middle of last week when I didn't sleep for two days in a row, okay? Didn't find much to be grateful for. You wouldn't think, would you? I'm grateful that Eric Marr saw me comment one day last week and said, hey, you all right? No, I'm not. He's one I can be just totally honest with. Thank you, Eric Marr. You're my favorite dark knight. <laughs> And he said, do you want me to read to you? No, nope, Eric Mar, I can't read. I just can't. I don't want to be read to. You know what he said then? I'll pray for you. Oh. And my God, when that man puts people, he's got not just him, he's got an army of people that'll pray. His little crew over there. Oh my God, you guys have trouble anytime. Call, hit up Eric Mar, Say, I need somebody to pray for me. And if you don't like that word, say, I need somebody to give me some good thoughts. Because those people, oh my God. I am grateful for that. I am grateful that I didn't sleep. I'm grateful that my feet hurt. I'm grateful that I was miserable because in all that misery, I found people that love me and showed me that they would. I had one person tell me anything you need, anything, even if it's money, you tell me, I'm going to take care of it. This is one of my dark nights. He told me that. I am so grateful. I want you guys to just, if you can't do that like I can, because I, let's say I have spiritualism down pat, because I've had to. I've had such a hard time that if I didn't have God with me, I would be dead right now. I literally would be dead. But you guys might not be as far down the road. So just find one thing every day. And I want them to start thinking don't be grateful for just what you saw that was good. There's some things, like I said, pain. You don't think pain is a good thing? But pain taught me that I can't do it myself. I can't handle this myself. I have to share this with someone else. And sharing it lessens it. And we were talking about how my pain is lessened because I'm occupied and happy and distracted. But it's not just that. You know why? Because I'm happy about what I'm doing. I am so excited. That would be another thing if I tell you one other thing. Don't do something for money. Do it for love. That love word, yes, that's God. But that's in your heart. You know, there's something that you love more than anything in the world. Mine is music other than people. There is something in you that you love. And that thing that you love is probably something you should be doing. 
And I used to tell my kids when they were little, and I know everybody's parents probably said the same, do something you love, not something that makes them, at least that's what I heard from my parents, you know. You might love your money, but if you don't love what you're doing, you're going to hate your job. Not everything has to be a job. Just love your what's most important to you. Take advantage of that. If you love music, find a way to share it with someone. And that gratitude will take... I, I know I bitch and moan. I bitch and moan to you. You bitch and moan to me. But I'm so grateful that I've got you to bitch and moan to. <laughs> Isn't it lovely? Yeah. I think so. What you were saying just a little while ago, be, you can be grateful for the horrible things. When you were saying that, just a little memory popped into my mind of reading one of the Corrie Teen Boom. Do you remember Corrie Teen Boom? Oh, yes. And she used to do these great missionary trips into communist countries and then get, she, she got, yeah. I don't know, at one stage she talks about how she was in prison or they were, mm -hmm. they were all these people were all in little houses, in little sort of, sheds somewhere all all shut in together i don't remember the story exactly but what i remember is that they had terrible terrible fleas in their little house and it was just so awful they could just they, they were just like covered in these creatures that were everywhere they were bitten everywhere they were miserable when the guards came to their door to give them the food the fleas would sort of jump up off the floor like this and they'd have like these swarms and so for some reason, somebody made them be thankful to God for the fleas. And they were like, eat so down. Just do it. Just be thankful for your fleas. Anyway, they started praying thank you for their fleas. And they realized after a few weeks that actually, because they had this terrible flea infestation, the guards were leaving them alone. And the other couple of huts that didn't have any fleas, the guards were terrible guards were terribly harassing them and being awful Abusive. and you don't always know why you have to be grateful or why you have to be grateful for horrible things you know and uh, nope. grief and losing people is a horrible thing and there's nothing in that that you can be grateful for there's nothing in losing somebody and yet mm -hmm. We've been told, we've been given the absolute instruction to be grateful for it. And yeah, the Bible says to be happy when someone dies. <laughs> wow. And Clown World says, don't be happy. And it comes over and over and over again. Who do you choose, God or the clowns? I'll take God any day. You know that song, Send in the Clowns? Yeah. You know, maybe it's rich, maybe it's, but what in, ha, happens when it's all messed up? The clowns come in. Do we really want to keep living that way? We really want to. And when you're grateful, you can, the, something I've learned with being grateful, you can turn that into a weapon, you know. You can say, God, I'm grateful for even this horrible time, and I'm going to, this word is called, it's a Christian word, praise, but it means I'm just going to, Tell everyone I can tell and tell God more than anyone. My weapon is praise. I am not going to let this get the best of me. I'm going to say, hallelujah, I got somebody up there that can manage it. And here, this is an awful. Uh, there's a story about that song, um, I'll Raise a Hallelujah. Yes. This little boy got sick all of a sudden. His parents, they didn't know what was going on. And he went, oh drastically downhill really quick and the people of the church got together to pray and they thought that baby was going to die and the parents were like I don't know what to do but I know one thing God told me to praise and that's where that song came from I raise a hallelujah in the middle of the mystery and they sang that song and they were sure they were going to have to be comforting this mother and father that baby was going to die. He lived. That baby lived. Those people weren't saying, dear God, I can't handle this baby. Heal that baby. No. I raise a hallelujah in the middle of all of it, no matter what. You know, if we could keep that and that baby lived. Now, not all the time will that happen. 
but that just gives you an example. They were grateful and they went to their community and then they went and carried it to God. And instead of going, why did you do this? They're saying, here he is, I'm grateful and I'm fighting this evil by praising. I'm not going to fight it by sitting here worrying and asking the doctor what to do. I'm going to praise. Pray. And it makes pray it and then praise and then be grateful. No, and nice. sometimes that maybe that baby will end up dying. But in that I've thought of some, I, I know somebody who had a baby that had a high fever and they said, if the baby lives, he's not, there's nothing going to be left. It's just going to, you're going to have a shell there. That baby ended up dying. Well, that was the best thing in that time. Honestly, would you want your baby living like just a piece of flesh? Mm -hmm. So it was sad and horrible, but that was the best thing at that point. Mm -hmm. And you might think you didn't get the answer, but you don't know down the road what would have happened if that had not changed that way? It's something that every little thing that we go through, every terrible thing. Someday we'll have to talk about the horrible things that have happened to us because I don't think people have any clue what horrors we've lived through. I'll tell you just a few. I was raped. I was molested when I was five years old. It continued till I was 12 with two family members. I was raped by my best friend's brother. I was raped again walking to school by some guy that was another best friend's brother. I have gone through hell. I've had a gun up against my head and said, you're going to hell, heaven right now. Because I'm, guess what? The gun didn't go off. You, I have gone through some stuff that would scare the bejesus out of people. And I am still here. And I don't look back at it and go, oh my God, somebody tried to kill me. Oh my, No. You know what? That time there, that taught me that I could trust that God was going to be with me. And say, well, he did shoot me and I died. I was trusting God right then and there. I was saying right then, oh, well, guess I'm coming on. <laughs> you know, it, there's another verse in the Bible that says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Everybody puts so much value on this earth. Uh, yeah, it, it's a beautiful thing, but it can be an ugly thing and a horrible thing. But I can guarantee you, it's not going to last forever. You are all, every last one of us is going to die someday. And I think all these, you know, here I am. This is my life. This yeah. walker. Yeah. A lot of people will be going, thanks, God. I don't have legs left. You know what I'm saying? Thank you, God. Somebody gave me this walker. <laughs> I did. I got that walker for free. That's such a blessing, isn't it? Yeah. And I, you know, people are saying, why don't you ask God to heal you? Why isn't God healing you? Well, we've got some ideas about what, what the problem might be because we've been talking about how God's working, right? But if he doesn't heal me, I don't care. I've told him him i told god use this body it was given to me it's not mine take it do what you want with it i am i told you that story about we're broken because that's how the light gets through oh my god am i a broken lady yeah oh, I hear you. but he me put too. me back together i i was in a hospital i had nine shock treatments couldn't even tell you my name because i was so depressed that my husband hit me that i would rather die i turned my head to the wall and I went inside so bad, I was catatonic. Can you look at this person and think that I ever was like that? I was done. And he brought me back. God brought me back from that. And if God can bring me back from that, he can bring you back from your husband being killed in a car wreck. He can bring you back from your daughter walking away. He can, God can help you with no matter what. But if you're not grateful, even for the things that you don't think are right, I'll tell you what, if you realized how many things God saved you from, if you could, but if God can show you someday, you know, right here, you could have been dead, but I had you stop at that stop sign and you didn't come to that road where I know that was going to happen. You're not, you have no idea how many times God has saved you. So I, the only word I can think of is to be grateful. Every last second of your day, and we, we use these words like pray, 
But every the second of the day, even when things start to bottom, I think, I'm so glad I'm getting a chance to do this. I think of it as a training ground, a boot camp. Life, honestly, there's a lot of times life sucks. It can be horrible. Yep. But there are those little tiny moments. And if you get your mind off all the things, oh, I got to do this, I got to do that. And you just just be grateful for that, what you have right there. Mm-hmm. And just mm-hmm. let let go of it yourself. Quit trying to, I know I've done it. And I keep saying, oh, I'm getting, you know, like it just, I give it all. Oh, yeah, I go, ah, give me that. I want to try it. You know? And then it's a constant thing. You have to turn around and say, oh, I can't do it. Here, have it. <laughs> It's a, it's a continual thing. You have to continually lay it down and say, I can't do it. But if you get to that point and you just, Ugh, yeah, show yeah. me what to do. I don't know what to do. The answers are going to be there. Yeah. But you can't get them if you don't have the right attitude. I know that old phrase, attitude of gratitude. But that stuck with me, didn't I? I just said attitude of gratitude. If you keep that in your head, I don't see how you can go wrong. Like Victor Franco, that man, he was grateful that he was harassed and harangued because he he put it down and, and he defended this thing. He was willing to die to be able to get this out. To us. Because he knew that we were going to need this. He knew it wasn't just him. And he was grateful for that time being because out of all that hardness... Here we got this book. And I think of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I've read about, a lot of people don't know who he was, but he was a German pastor and he went against Hitler. He was not going to let the Jews go. And he was outspoken about it. And he did things that got him in trouble with the government. He ended up in prison. And I heard that at the end of the war, he was killed. But people don't know what they did to that man. That man was hung and not allowed to die. They would get into just almost, and then say, tell me you don't believe in Jesus anymore. No, nope, he wouldn't. They hung him again until it was almost, this was repeated over and over and over and over again. But because he'd seen all his life that God was there and God was faithful, he knew that, yeah, they're gonna kill me. This is torture, but I'm not gonna say, I don't believe in the person that brought me all the way through this. And when they finally done with me i'm still going to go to heaven there's nothing they can do to this indestructible part what's the indestructible part not this thing that's Mm. falling apart it's what's inside and he was willing to give up and put go through that hell because he had that kind of faith Mm. now i have that kind of faith because i've been through the river and the valley and let him let god lead me and a lot of people out there probably haven't had that and they don't have that trust and they don't know that you can depend on something bigger than you and they're looking at me right now probably going huh you really think that you think that if i get a hold of this thing that everything's it might not work out the way you want it but that god he sees what we can't see and I'll say it one more time. I'm Josh. Thank you, Josh. Who, he helped me to get this idea. We were talking about life. We're stuck on a platter like a record. We have to go through every last circle on that record until. And a lot of people don't even know what a record is. A CD or or your MP3. Okay, we're stuck in that recording. God isn't stuck in that recording. He's, God sees the day you were born. God sees before you were even considered. God sees when your mom and dad looked at each other and now, whoop, there it goes. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost. 
but now I'm found was blind but now I see twas grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieve how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed yea when this flesh and heart shall fail and mortal life shall cease. I shall possess within the veil a life of joy and peace amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see, was blind. But now I see.